2022 is the battles we're going to win in order to recover ground that was taken. And in doing so, the church is going to come to a new, dare I say, militant level of maturity. We need people all over the country to be willing to put on that full armor of God. We will fight. And the way that we will fight is through the inbreaking of the kingdom of God to the earth. And we will consume everything with the power of God. And we will take back this world. Nobody, not even the devil himself, can stop what God has planned for this season, for this hour, for such a time as this. This is Isaiah 60. It's time for the glorious church of the Lord Jesus Christ to arise and shine like never before. And we are going to take this nation back. We are the army of God, and we are going to take this nation back. A controversial bill became law today in Florida. The Republican governor signed the measure that bans lessons on sexual orientation and gender identity in kindergarten through third grade. This is in Florida and other places school for very young kids, the gender bread man. Before Governor Ron DeSantis signed HB 1557 into law, he made a point to show why the bill was needed. Looked in the mirror, I saw a girl, kind of. Now I see a boy who has a transgender. So this is something that you're putting into classroom curriculum. And those materials, he says, were just a few examples. DeSantis says the bill will make sure materials like them will no longer be present from kindergarten through third grade. People protesting outside Walt Disney Studios in Burbank tonight over what they are calling the company's quote unquote woke agenda. This anger stemming from Disney recently coming out against Florida's parental rights in education bill, which critics have dubbed the don't say gay bill. To teach them at such a young age and to have a task force focusing on teaching these things to kids, I think it's just morally wrong as a Christian and just what I believe in my personal beliefs. In what appeared to be part church service and part protest, the group called Hold the Line is also encouraging people to hit the entertainment titan in the pocketbook. Right now it's a time to boycott and then it's a time to stand up. Were there lasting repercussions of that protest? Yeah, I mean, I think it's momentum. You know, it's starting to build, it's starting to grow. We're, we're doing another one this Wednesday at Disneyland in Anaheim here in Orange County. And, uh, you know, I think the, you've seen the effects in the stock price. You've seen the effects of, of hundreds of thousands of Americans canceling their subscription to Disney Plus. And really the overall pushback from parents uh, is starting to gain some traction. Disney's posturing has alienated a lot of people now. And so the political influence they're used to wielding, I think, has dissipated. Uh, I think that's why they've gotten so, one of the reasons they've got so far over their skis on this, on this parental rights stuff, uh, because I think they're used to having their way, and they're not used to having people that will stand in their way and say, actually, the state of Florida is going to be governed by the best interests of the people in Florida. You know, we're certainly not going to bend a knee uh, to woke executives in California. Ron DeSantis leading the path on this. R Rich Lowry has a really, really good piece in the New York Times today called Republicans Need a L New Leader. They are looking to Florida. As you know, I think Governor DeSantis is the best governor in the country. He's also my governor here in the state of Florida. What stands out as a true departure is DeSantis' willingness to use government power in the culture war. Sometimes this has involved areas like public education where the government has every right to set the rules. One such example is the Don't Say Gay Bill, more properly known as the Parental Rights and Education Bill, which prohibits classroom instruction on sexual orientation or gender identity in kindergarten through third grade. Then there's the fight with Disney. The revocation of its special tax status is a frankly retaliatory act that also presents free speech issues and could prove a legal and policy morass. That said, Disney got a truly extraordinary deal from the state that allowed it, in effect, to run its own city. The company never would have been granted this arrangement 55 years ago if its executives had told the state's leaders. And by the way, eventually the Walt Disney Company will adopt cutting edge left wing causes as its own. The broader point of making an example of Disney is to send a message to other corporations. There could be downsides to letting themselves be pushed by progressive employers into making their institutions weapons in the culture wars. 
and conclude it's best to stick to flying planes, selling soda, and so on. Conservatives have been learning to appreciate Moynihan's liberal truth. If Florida's culture war initiatives succeed, the education establishment in the state will not mindlessly absorb the latest left-wing fad. Corporations will be war- will be warier of wading into hot-button social fights. In other words, the culture of these institutions will have changed for the better. This is correct. All of this is very good. So the fight against woke capital has begun, and that is definitely a positive. All right, guys, welcome back. Uh, this is part two of the coming pendulum swing. We're going to talk about what's been happening with Disney and the collective pushback against the LGBT uh, woke movement and how it's giving rise to uh, the false light delusion on a larger scale than ever before. So first up, for those who don't know, uh, back in March, Governor Ron DeSantis uh, signed what's called the Parental Rights and Education Bill, which uh, bans teaching sexual orientation and gender identity in kindergarten through third grade, which had apparently been getting quite extreme. Uh, you heard uh, DeSantis in those uh, intro clips refer to something that they were using in the classrooms called uh, the gender bread man to teach young kids about gender fluidity. Uh, it would be comical if it wasn't real. Uh, but this is how extreme this stuff has gotten. And so DeSantis pushed back with this bill, which the left protested, calling it the don't say gay bill, uh, saying that it was being hateful and discriminatory against gays and transgenders. And Disney openly sided with the LGBT movement in opposing DeSantis's bill and started getting very blatant with their promotion of LGBT. Uh, in late March, shortly after DeSantis signed the Parental Rights and Education Bill, uh, Disney executives held this all-hands meeting, a conference call, uh, where they openly talked about their plans to further push homosexuality uh, in their movies. Uh, one producer named Latoya Ravino even used the phrase, not-so-secret gay agenda. Uh, referring to what she wanted to put into future Disney projects. Uh, here's a little bit of what they said. We have many, many, many LGBTQIA characters in our stories, and 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 yet we don't have enough leads um, and narratives in which gay characters just just get to be characters. Our leadership over there has been so welcoming to like my like not at all secret gay agenda and so like i i feel like i felt like it was i mean like maybe it was that way in the past but i guess like something must have happened in the last like like they are turning it around they're going hard and then all that like momentum that i felt like that sense of i don't have to be afraid to like let's have these two characters kiss let's in the background this like i was just Wherever I could, just basically adding queerness to, like, the, if you see anything queer in the show, I'm proud of them. But, like, I, I just was like, no one would stop me and no one was trying to stop me. So, as you can imagine, this led to widespread backlash from conservatives, including Ron DeSantis, who uh, then went on to sign a bill in late April that, if it ends up getting passed, will rid Disney of its special tax status. Apparently, Disney has enjoyed special tax privileges for quite a while now. Uh, they've essentially been their own governing district, and that might be coming to an end. So uh, there's been this pretty intense back and forth this year in Florida. And I think what's happened there is a microcosm of things that are taking place on a national and global level. And it's a foreshadowing of things to come. In April, Sean Foyt joined in on the fight against Disney and the LGBT agenda and started hosting rallies and protests at Disney through his organization called Hold the Line, uh, which is a very culture war type name. They've been pushing this defund Disney trend, even having it put on t-shirts, and they've been creating petitions for parents to sign as part of what he's been calling Parents Fight Back. So this stuff at Disney has been uh, another opportunity for Sean Foyt uh, to gain more influence and look more righteous as a Jehu type to stand up against this dark, wicked, Jezebelic agenda. With the intensification of the Jezebelic agenda, we see the equal intensification of the Jehu movement. Right, Jezebel comes first, then Jehu comes riding in to throw her down. So you need to have the dark side to rise up and get bad first in order to have the false light side empowered to the point where it comes riding in. And this has most definitely been happening this year with the LGBT movement. 
And speaking of Jezebel being thrown down and the foreshadowing of things to come, uh, Disney has really suffered financially as a result of all this. And so that, coupled with them likely losing their special tax privileges and not being the best of friends with you know the governor of Florida, Ron DeSantis, it's all very indicative of a major downfall for Disney this year, which lines up with this overall Jezebelic exposure and downfall that we're seeing more and more of. In fact, their stock started to plummet pretty dramatically shortly after they opposed DeSantis's bill. And this was pointed out during the Flashpoint Live episode that I showed back in part one. Uh, here's Gene Bailey, the host of Flashpoint, talking about the drop in Disney stock, which leads to thunderous applause from the audience. But I want you to see what happened. Put up that stock chart. Now, let, let, me, let me make sure you guys understand it. I'm not against anybody, uh, businesses making money and doing stuff like that. I am, however, against any company that decides they're going to stand up and tell me how to raise my children, how to, how to, what they're going to do, and I'm not going to sit them in front of my grandkids or not going to sit in front of a TV with that junk on it. Now, that's year-to-date stock price. Let's look what happened April 20th when Flashpoint was on. That's you! That's you! That, that's all. I'm telling you, you got the power! You got the power! Yeah, you and you and you and you and you! Look at that! You know, Lance, that almost looks like November 3rd, with the way the... <laughs> you see, I think all of America, gentlemen, is waking up that they really do have power. So it's very clear that Disney has rapidly become another one of these blatantly evil villains that the false prophets can speak against and look righteous for doing so. If Sean Foyt and Gene Bailey and Lance Wallnow recognize that Disney is evil, then there's something deeper going on here, a more deceptive snare. In fact, Gene Bailey somewhat referenced this more deceptive snare. Uh, some of you probably picked up on what he said at the end there. He said how all of America is waking up to their power. This is one of the main attributes of the false light great awakening, waking up to our power. And it's one of the major deceptions being pushed in this culture war against leftism. It's not about waking up to our sin and our need for a savior, but waking up to the agenda of the elites and then waking up to the power and influence that we can wield against the so-called powers of darkness who control the left to take it down and usher in Christ's kingdom or bring it to fullness. So first, we wake up to the so-called demonic agenda and then we wake up to the power and authority that we can have in taking down that demonic agenda. Uh, whether it's the charismatic NAR crowd who uh, really emphasizes the spiritual signs and wonders and casting down demons, or the more laid-back reformed post-millennial crowd. The same rule applies to them too. Uh, just because they aren't up on stages decreeing and declaring in this very emotional and charismatic fashion doesn't mean that they aren't pushing the false light. They are pushing the same ideas, just in a more laid-back fashion, which actually gives them an even more powerful cloak of deception because they aren't spewing out false prophecies left and right, and they present themselves as more biblically grounded. Right. This kind of ties in with what I was talking about with Kanye uh, and his pastor when he first you know, so-called converted. He was under a Calvinist pastor, and that made Jeff Durbin very hopeful. But don't be fooled here. They are pushing the same false awakening concepts that Gene Bailey was talking about. It's just that it's more grounded in the real world and less, you know, in the clouds as the NAR is. They're pushing the same idea of the church waking up to its power via the political system and exercising its authority through the governmental structures in order to establish Christ's reign over all things, as they describe it. 
So it's the same idea across the board, both NAR and Reformed, of the church and Christians waking up to their power and authority and establishing dominion in some fashion. Because keep in mind, post-millennialists believe that dominion has already been given back to the saints. So whether it's Jeff Durbin and Joseph Boot and Doug Wilson and Jared Longshore, or it's Lance Wallnow and Gene Bailey and Mario Murillo, it doesn't matter how different these two wings of Christianity seem. They are on the same false, great awakening, dominionist trajectory and feeding the church the same lie about its quote-unquote power in this world about its right to dominion. And this is how much of the modern church is right in step with the New Age agenda, which is all about waking people up to their power and rising up against the demonic agenda of the Great Reset and tyranny and communism and big tech and big pharma and all these things that the truther movement has been focusing on and exposing for decades, uh, which, as I'm going to show you guys, is now the exact same enemy of the Christian right. You know, the Christian right today is not only talking about fighting against the Great Reset and communism, but they're now publicly calling out big tech and even big pharma, as I'll talk about later in the series. For years, I've heard the truther crowd use the term big pharma, and now I'm hearing it coming from Johnny Enlow and even mainstream conservative commentators like Ben Shapiro and Matt Walsh. This is further proof that the conspiracy truther narrative has become completely mainstream. You know, like I said, Big Pharma was always an exclusively truther term that only the Alex Jones types would use. Same with the term deep state, which has now become mainstream. But it's now something that's being acknowledged as a demonic enemy on a mainstream level by this new Christian right that's rising up. We'll get into that more later, but it's mind-boggling when you really think about what's happening and you can see the big picture. This is what I've been warning about for years, guys, since 2016, that the truth or conspiracy narrative would go mainstream and that trutherism was the foundation of the real beast kingdom. It would be the foundation for this rebellion against the new world order and that it would rise up in a spirit of revolution. And I'm going to be elaborating on this more throughout this video, but all trutherism has been exposing for decades is Jezebel or the harlot. And keep in mind who destroys the harlot, the beast, right? And unfortunately, much of the Christian community has bought into the idea that quote-unquote Jezebel is the one ushering in the beast system, when really it's Jehu who will rise up against all this overtly dark and tyrannical stuff that we're seeing so much of nowadays. So in some form or another, everyone right now is waking up to the power that they have waking up to their rights, their freedoms, their constitutional authority, and their spiritual power and authority over demons and or the demonically run totalitarian state. And the way that this played out at this Flashpoint Live event was that everyone was waking up to this idea that, you know, wow, we have power in this culture war. We can take down Disney and Hollywood if we just rise up together and fight back and boycott. This is all appealing to human pride. Boycotting Disney is not spiritual warfare. Now, if you don't feel comfortable giving your money to Disney or allowing your children to see anything from Disney or buy anything from Disney, that's fine. I'm not saying you have to go to the other extreme and continue supporting Disney. What I'm warning against here is getting caught up in the idea that all spiritual warfare entails is speaking out against cultural immorality outside the church and being deceived into thinking that this culture war is a spiritual war between God and Satan, or God's kingdom and Satan's kingdom. Because that is fundamentally a New Age view of spiritual warfare. This is a culture war between white and black magic. And the devil is using the rise of the black magic side to recruit professing Christians to join the white magic uprising. And we can see this playing out with the conservative Christian community's response to Disney's promotion of the LGBT movement. For example, here's what Mike Huckabee had to say in response to the meeting where Disney executives talked about pushing their not-so-secret gay agenda. The Disney brand was magic, and Walt Disney was like everyone's favorite uncle who was rich 
and had all the cool stuff. I mean, the Disney movies were dependably wholesome, family-friendly, and most all of them had a moral lesson embedded in the plot. Parents knew that their kids could see a Disney film and be entertained without being embarrassed or indoctrinated. Just a few years back, we took our entire family to Disney World. Oh, sure, it was mostly about taking the grandkids there and making sure that they were indulged to the hilt. But the wonderful family-friendly company that Walt Disney founded is gone, replaced by creepy corporate executives who have lost their minds and will likely lose a lot of their customers. They certainly have lost me. Folks, this is so outrageous that it's hard to believe that the Disney company has become such a purveyor of soft porn and wokeism that instead of entertaining children with fantasy and magic, Disney's new model is sexual fantasy, outright betrayal and rejection of traditional values of marriage and gender. And instead of moral neutrality, Disney has opted for immoral advocacy. This ain't kid stuff. And I, for one, don't want to enrich the people that have destroyed the magic kingdom and turned it into the perverted palace. So Mike Huckabee laments the fall of the magic kingdom. The leftists have destroyed the magic kingdom. In other words, the black magicians have destroyed the white magic kingdom. That's essentially what he's saying. Honestly, this is very reminiscent of how New Agers lament the fall of Atlantis. Okay, they often say how Atlantis fell through the corruption of black magic. They'll say that it was originally this white magic paradise, but then the black magicians came in and destroyed it with their greed and perversion and materialism. Mike Huckabee is essentially expressing that same sentiment by saying how the Disney brand was magic and it's fallen because of the corruption of this woke agenda. So this is another example of how the Great Awakening and this movement that's exposing the deep state is rooted in a white magic mentality. It's the light side of the force that promotes democracy and freedom and national strength and good morals and family values, and it's standing against the evil empire. And that's how Mike Huckabee describes the Disney of the past. He said... It used to be wholesome and promote good moral lessons in their movies and TV shows. So in his mind, it's okay to entertain children with magic as long as the values promoted alongside that magic are pro-heterosexual marriage and pro-conservatism. There's nothing wrong with magic as long as that magic doesn't run counter to traditional American values. So this lines up with the typology of the two opposing systems of idolatry in the story of Jehu and how Jehu was only opposed to one form of idolatry. He only had a problem with the foreign idolatry, the black magic you know, that targeted children, just like the idolatry that the Christian right is fighting today. They're only fighting the foreign idolatry that's attacking children, the Baal and the Molech idols, but promoting the national idolatry that somewhat resembles the worship of God, just like the golden calves that mimic the temple system in Jerusalem. The Baal idolatry also represented a threat to Jehu's power because Jezebel was a foreign queen, right? She was the daughter of the king of Tyre, and she was the main conduit for bringing that Baal cult into Israel and getting Ahab to uh, build a house of Baal in the capital. Uh, the Israelites had worshipped Baal prior to that, you know, during the period of the judges, but not to the degree that it occurred during the reign of Jezebel. So the Baal cult represented a foreign invasion, not just spiritually foreign, but nationally and culturally foreign too, because Jezebel was a foreigner. And Jehu simply fought against that foreign invasion, which is what the Christian right is doing today. They're combating the foreign invasion of communism and wokeness and globalism and promoting national idolatry. And when you think about it, what they're doing is actually even more extreme than what Jehu did because they're actually using the promotion of our national idols to help kick out the foreign idols, whereas we don't necessarily see that with Jehu. It's not like he built up the golden calf system, right? He didn't tear down the house of Baal and erect more golden calves in its place. He simply allowed the golden calf system that was already in place to continue. 
but the Great Awakening is actively promoting and erecting more golden calves to squeeze out the bales. Not surprisingly, Sean Foyt's reaction to Disney going woke was very similar to Mike Huckabee's. Here's a snippet of an interview that he did on Fox News about the rallies he was holding. So, you know, Disney has entertained our kids for decades. We've loved it. I've taken my kids to Disney World. It's been amazing. They've loved the movies. But they crossed a line in the sand when they began to enable those who want to fight to sexualize our kids. So we started a petition at, at fight, uh, parentsfightback.com. Parentsfightback.com. We have 20,000 signatures on that petition. And we thought we got to put feet to that petition. And so we're going to gather today in Burbank at the Disney headquarters, 6 p.m. tonight. We're going to have a rally. We're going to let our voice be heard. We're going to let parents. Uh, we have former Disney employees, current Disney employees. Huh. We have people in the industry. And we're just going to take a stand. Right. So just like Mike Huckabee, he was fine with Disney before it went woke. That's when they crossed the line for him. In other words, he was fine with the Magic Kingdom until it started promoting black magic. Only now it's satanic to him. Only now it's demonic. Which demonstrates that he's a white magician because he has no problem at all with the white magic that Disney has been promoting for decades. He only has a problem with the blatantly dark black magic, the Baalism. He has no problem with the good magic that promotes, quote-unquote, family-friendly traditional values. Magic is fine as long as it's not anti-American. It's only the left-hand path that he has a problem with. And remember, the left-hand path is another name for black magic. And the right-hand path is another name for white magic. And Sean Foyt, along with much of the Christian right and this whole Great Awakening, is simply following the right-hand path, trying to stop the agenda of the left-hand path, the leftist tyrannical New World Order. And what's also interesting is that the right hand is one of the two places that people will take the mark of the beast, which further shows how the Great Awakening, in following the right-hand path, is the real precursor to the beast system, which will have this incredibly deceptive appearance of righteousness and godliness, Unlike the Great Reset, which is very blatantly dark and evil, just like the Empire in the Star Wars series. So Sean Foyt and Mike Huckabee only think that now Disney is something that should be avoided. And only now it's something that we need to protect our children from. Sleeping Beauty, Cinderella, Fantasia, Peter Pan, Alice in Wonderland. They have no issue with their children seeing these things even though they promote ideas and concepts that are clearly against the Word of God, the Word of God that they pretend to follow. It's only when they make Peter Pan a transgender character that it becomes a problem. It really is quite silly when you think about the logic behind the collective outcry here. And Huckabee and Foyt are far from the only ones who reacted to Disney like this. In fact, I've seen a similar response pretty much across the board in the conservative Christian camp. And if you've had a similar reaction to where LGBT promotion is what finally crosses the line for you, you know, that's the straw that breaks the camel's back, I would encourage you to really ask yourself why. Because Disney has always been a secular, anti-biblical institution. Contrary to what many Christians think, Walt Disney was not a godly man. Now, I'm not going to get into the topic of whether or not he's a Freemason. Frankly, I don't care whether he was a Freemason or not, and it doesn't really matter. And those kinds of discussions tend to only lead to dives into the rabbit hole. The point is that Walt Disney was not a godly man. And if your view of Disney has dramatically changed only because of its recent promotion of the woke agenda, and you had no problem with Disney before this, then I would challenge you to ask, what is it that I really have a problem with here? Do I have a problem with Disney because it's anti-biblical? Or do I have a problem with them being anti-American? Because Disney hasn't gotten more anti-biblical. They've just gotten more anti-American. And that's what Sean Foyt and Mike Huckabee's real issue is. And they are both clearly of the false light. And if we're reacting to cultural phenomenon in the same way that the false light is, we need to make sure and check ourselves spiritually and make sure that there's not any idolatry in our hearts that's making us react that way. 
Because I can assure you, idolatry is what made Sean Foyt and Mike Huckabee react that way to Disney's woke agenda. It wasn't out of a love for God. It was out of a love for their country and their freedoms and their attachment to this world. And if we're reacting to things in the same way that they are, then it might be for the same idolatrous reasons. And we need to ask ourselves that. We shouldn't be reacting to cultural phenomenon in the same way that the false light is. Because one of the defining characteristics of the false light is how it reacts to cultural phenomenon. And I think what many Christians are really up in arms about over Disney promoting LGBT is that it represents a threat to religious freedom and the American paradise. Because for many people, Disney siding with the LGBT movement and pushing homosexuality in their movies represents an attack against their country more so than their faith. Because the stability of the family is seen as one of the main building blocks of the American paradise, which this communist woke invasion is trying to dismantle for its own globalist agenda. And so if the family structure is attacked, now we're angry and up in arms about what Disney's pushing because it's a sign of an increasing communist incursion on the American paradise. Again, black magic invading and corrupting a white magic paradise, just like Atlantis. So I think Christians who are only now all of a sudden upset over the so-called anti-biblical agenda of Disney are being hypocritical and revealing their fleshly attachments to the world, uh, which is one of the main things that's pulling people into the Great Awakening deception, is their love for this world. Because again, Disney has always been anti-biblical. But it hasn't always been a threat to the rights and freedoms of American Christians. That's the real issue here. That's why people are so upset. Not because it's anti-biblical, but because now it's anti-American. Because it's moved from the golden calf idolatry to Baal idolatry. And now that Disney is pushing something that's potentially causing the downfall of the nation, right, the so-called Judeo-Christian values that America is supposedly founded on, now, all of a sudden, people are saying it's anti-Christian or anti-biblical. But I think what a lot of people mean by anti-biblical or anti-Christian is anti-American. And that's one of the main problems in the church today, is that Christians can't delineate between their love for God and their love for their country. God and country, faith and freedom. It's all part of one idolatrous mess. Christ himself said, you can't serve two masters. But that's what much of the church today is trying to do. They have very divided hearts. And I think a perfect example of this is the response to the Buzz Lightyear film that recently came out, which included a homosexual kiss between two characters. Everybody was talking about it and saying, you know, Lightyear is promoting homosexuality. Don't take your children to see it. And many Christian parents were saying, you know, I was going to take my kids to see this, but now I'm not because of the gay kiss. And to be honest, I, I found that to be a strange response because homosexuality is far from the only issue with the film. But that seems to have been the breaking point for a lot of Christian parents, which to me is a bit too similar to the response that Mike Huckabee and Sean Foyt had. If the breaking point for allowing your kids to see that film was its inclusion of homosexuality, does that mean it would have been okay if not for the homosexuality? Because that seems to be the general implication. And that's what I found strange, because the film also depicts deep space travel and alien life forms and the idea of the Galactic Alliance, which are all very popular concepts in the New Age. The whole hero-villain struggle in the film reflects a very New Age Gnostic view of reality. Uh, for example, the main antagonist of the film is Emperor Zerg. And it says here that he's, quote, the sworn enemy of the Galactic Alliance. The Galactic Alliance and the Galactic Federation of Light are actual beliefs in the New Age. Uh, New Agers often talk about having visions and astral traveling to meet members of the Galactic Alliance. For example, this is a New Age YouTuber named Elizabeth April. I played this clip in my Greg Locke video from last year. And here she talks about how the Galactic Federation is here to help raise our consciousness and liberate us from the prison planet, uh, which is what the Great Awakening Deception is all about, defeating the dark agenda. 
There's another agenda above that, which is the Galactic Federation agenda, right? Who is here to help us raise our consciousness, to liberate us from this so-called prison planet, you know? The other way that they've been helping us for years now, and I'm a pretty good case of that or example of that is um, members of the Galactic Federation, GFL alumni, if you want to call them that, uh, they have been lining up and volunteering for probably hundreds, if not hundreds of thousands of years to come to this planet um, to be a volunteer here to help liberate us from the inside. And I do believe that the darkness is just as important as the light to help us grow and expand and move forward. And we are eradicating that darkness. And that's why we're seeing the collapse. That's why we're seeing uh, the purging. That's why we're seeing, you know, just the exposure uh, that's happening right now at this time. And, and that's really what we're going to see more and more of moving into 2021. So the Buzz Lightyear film promotes the same kinds of things that New Agers believe in and talk about seeing in their visions and communications with otherworldly entities like the Galactic Federation in this war between good and bad aliens. Christian parents should be just as concerned, if not more so, about their kids seeing that stuff as they are about seeing homosexuality. And I find it interesting that Emperor Zerg, the main enemy in the Buzz Lightyear film, uh, has a very Gnostic Archon look to him. Right? He's got this very obvious, menacing look with the devil horns and red eyes which is another representation of the obvious evil that the Gnostic false light is fighting against. So the whole film is essentially rooted in Gnosticism and New Age. So why is it only the homosexual kiss that made parents not want to take their kids to see it? Again, that's very similar to Mike Huckabee and Sean Foyt's response. They were fine with all the magical and New Age stuff, but the promotion of LGBT is too far. And I'm a bit concerned that so many other Christians are essentially responding in the same way. And that's why I'm wondering if maybe Christians are upset about the homosexuality in the Lightyear film because it represents a danger to the stability of the nation as opposed to it being anti-biblical. That's what I hope people will consider pondering a little bit more deeply. You know, am I upset over the gay kiss in the Lightyear film because it's anti-biblical or because it's anti-American? In my view, we really shouldn't be this surprised or up in arms about a secular movie portraying a secular lifestyle. Why this is such a big issue for Christians is strange to me. I don't think Christians should be as appalled or surprised as they have been about a secular institution promoting a secular lifestyle. I think people are just upset because an avenue of entertainment is being taken away. The world is going to be the world, and we can't change that. But I think a lot of Christians are buying into the idea that we can change the world. And that's the lie that pulls you into the Great Awakening. And here's my issue. The sin of homosexuality should already be part of a church or ministry's teaching. This is not something that true saints, people truly born of God, need to be told. Pastors of good, solid churches do not need to spend time explaining to their congregation the evils of homosexuality. This should be basic stuff, and typically it is. But what's not basic stuff, and what's not generally part of many churches or ministries' teachings today, is the dangers of trutherism. Trutherism and the truther interpretation of the end times is being subtly promoted by pastors and teachers who are, quote-unquote, exposing Disney and exposing wokeness and exposing the deep state and big pharma and big tech censorship and so forth. And we're going to see this in a pretty extreme degree at the end of the video, um, how this exposure of the woke agenda is being used to promote very dangerous spiritual deception and very dangerous eschatology from the false light side. This incredibly deceptive New Age truther view of the beast system, which is what I've been warning about for the past six years, how a global revolt against the counterfeit beast system would emerge and would be the real great deception that Christians have been trying to put their finger on for decades. You know, for years and years, Christians have been talking about this great deception of the end times and trying to pinpoint exactly what it is. Well, this is it. And I see too many Christians being overly concerned with the woke agenda of Disney, i.e. Jezebel or the harlot, 
and not concerned enough with the deception coming from the Great Awakening, which is spreading as a result of the pushback against wokeness. Again, Jezebel gives rise to Jehu. You don't have a Jehu without a Jezebel. And while everyone's overly focused on the black magic of Jezebel, the white magic of the Jehu movement is spreading very subtly. All Disney has done is move from golden calves to bales. And that's really what much of the Christian right is upset about, that it's no longer promoting their golden calves. And I think the collective outrage over the wokeness of Disney reveals some idolatry in the hearts of many Christians. I've seen many examples of this over the years. You know, a lot of Christians have no problem with magic as long as it's family-friendly and pro-traditional American values. As long as it doesn't openly attack the basic principles of family, freedom, and Christian sexuality, then it's fine. You know, the popularity of C.S. Lewis is another example of this. Um, his Narnia novels are filled with white magic. But they're okay in many Christians' minds because they talk about Jesus and promote quote-unquote traditional values. And it's been concerning to see ministries that are considered more doctrinally sound reacting to the woke agenda in a similar fashion. Now, not all have been lamenting the downfall of the magic kingdom in the extreme way that Huckabee and Foyt are, but I've still found the overall response from the Christian community uh, to this Disney stuff to be too monolithic and a bit too similar to how the false light has responded to it. There's a lot of the same talking points, a lot of shared points of concern over the moral decline of American culture, and similar advice on how to deal with it. And that's what I find concerning. The culture war rhetoric is increasing. And I'm seeing this concerning trend of misusing and distorting biblical passages uh, like the armor of God in Ephesians 6 and forcing a culture war or prophetic spiritual warfare interpretation into them, as Ron DeSantis does, for example, in the trailer for this series. And we're going to see more examples of that. But this is not spiritual warfare. And one of the main indications of that is just how blatant this LGBT stuff is. Just like with everything else from the dark Jezebel side, they are very open about it, just like the people pushing the Great Reset who are also very open about their agenda and almost uh, comically over the top with how evil they are. Again, it's like the Emperor in the Star Wars series, who has this overtly menacing presence and maniacally laughs over how evil he is and how much he enjoys it. You'll own nothing and be happy about it. Mwahaha! You know, it's the same kind of thing. Just like the Great Reset, Disney's gay agenda is not so secret as that one producer so flagrantly put it. She was very adamant, almost giddy with excitement about how she just gets to add queerness wherever she can, as she said. This flagrant openness with the LGBT agenda should be a red flag, because the devil is never this open about his ultimate intentions, unlike these people who are very open about their intentions. There's nothing secretive or deceptive at least not in any kind of deep way, about what they're doing. It's all out in the open for everyone to see. Here's something to think about. Perhaps the devil, instead of coming with just a simple frontal assault, is utilizing a multi-layered strategy here, where he uses an obvious frontal attack that's very easily perceptible to the physical eyes and appeals to human pride and self-righteousness and our attachments to the flesh as a distraction for a larger deception. If the enemy is blatantly telling us what they're doing, then perhaps there's something deeper going on. And there's actually a story in the book of Joshua that illustrates this point perfectly. In Joshua chapter 7, an Israelite named Achan disobeys the Lord and takes some of the spoil from the people of Jericho who they had just defeated. And because of that sin, God stops fighting for Israel. And so they go into the next fight against the city of Ai without knowing that God isn't fighting for them anymore, and that leads to this shocking defeat. And God tells Joshua, there's sin in your camp, and I'm not going to fight for you anymore unless you deal with this sin. And so after the sin is dealt with, God returns to fight for Israel. 
and Joshua uses the previous defeat to his advantage in the next battle. He uses deception and the element of surprise to gain a foothold over his enemy. And what Joshua does is he sets a trap where he puts part of the army at the front of the city where the people of Ai can clearly see them through the city gates. And then he puts the other part of the army behind the city lying in ambush. And he uses his enemy's confidence from their previous victory to lure them out of the city with the promise of another easy victory. It says in Joshua 8.15 that Joshua and the Israelites pretended to be beaten before them and fled to the wilderness. So the Canaanites, taking the bait and blinded by their overconfidence, are lured away from the city, leaving it open for the ambush to sneak in and take the city and surround the Canaanites on both sides. This is one of the few times where creative military strategy is utilized by the Israelites. Uh, because usually God just you know strikes fear into Israel's enemies and they uh, flee in a panic or get hit with large hailstones or something like that. And it's just a simple and straightforward thing. Um, not that God isn't involved here, obviously he is, but God leads Joshua to utilize a creative military strategy and use the overconfidence of the enemy and the appeal of their fleshly senses to lure them into a trap. And it's also a great story about how God can use a past sin or a past defeat in our lives to help us, you know, win the next battle, so to speak, uh, so long as you're being repentant and obedient, of course. But the Canaanites, blinded by their pride and confidence, went after the obvious opponent that was right in front of them and appealed to their immediate senses. And because they were so blinded by their confidence, they walked right into a trap. They weren't discerning. And just thought, you know, oh, we got this. This will be another easy victory. No one in the Canaanite camp stopped to think, hang on a second. The Israelites are already running from us. Isn't this a little too easy? And that's kind of what I see across the board with how the Christian right has responded to the Disney and LGBT stuff. And the whole Great Reset agenda in general. Just like the Army of I, they're so focused on the obvious frontal attack against morality and tradition and rights, the attack that's in plain sight and in the flesh and very open and blatant about its intentions, and no one's thinking, isn't this a little too obvious? Isn't this a little too easy? But I think it's because many professing Christians, like the Canaanites, are blinded by their pride and their sensual attachments to the more deceptive spiritual traps that have been laid. They're so overconfident of victory, just like the post-millennialists always say, how they believe in victory, right? The church is going to be physically victorious in this age. They have an eschatology of victory. They're blinded by their confidence and the cheap promise of a coming victory that they're dropping their spiritual guard, leaving the protection of the city walls, so to speak, and pushing back against the obvious attack that's in plain sight completely blind to the ambush lying in wait behind the city walls. And before they know it, many of these Christians are going to find themselves surrounded by the enemy on both sides, and they're going to be spiritually devoured by Satan. And of course, it was God and Joshua who used this strategy in the Bible, but I see no reason to discount the possibility that Satan could utilize a similar strategy, especially when he has such a huge advantage in being completely unseen. The devil knows how to use our pride to lure us into spiritual traps. And pride is the most blinding thing. That's why it's especially dangerous. Of all the sins, that's the one that can harden the heart the most and make us the most spiritually blind. You know, we often talk about sexual immorality being the worst kind of sin, and I agree with that to an extent. But if a person remains humble, they can still find a place for repentance of that sin. But pride is what keeps us from repentance. And it makes us wise and righteous in our own eyes. It's like the Pharisee in Luke 18, who thought of himself as morally superior to others. On paper, he probably was morally superior to the tax collector. But Christ said that between the two, the tax collector was the one who went home justified before God because he was repentant and humble, while the Pharisee was blinded by his pride and his sense of self-righteousness. 
The prophet Obadiah spoke about the dangers of pride too. He says this to the Edomites in verse 3, The pride of your heart has deceived you, you who live in the clefts of the rock, in your lofty dwelling, who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? I got to say, this sounds very much like the leaders of the Great Awakening and the post-millennialists who proudly declare that they will not allow their land to be taken over by the heathens and the pagans. Who's going to bring me, one of God's elect, down to the ground? They're so confident that they're in a strong position, both physically and spiritually. But they mistakenly interpret their strong physical position as a strong spiritual position, too. The Edomites were only in a strong physical position, but not spiritually. The Apostle Paul was hardly ever in a strong physical position. He was imprisoned, beaten, mistreated, shipwrecked, and all the rest. But he was in a strong spiritual position because he finished the race, he kept the faith. And as he warns in 1 Corinthians 10.12, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. And unfortunately, there are many professing Christians who think that they're standing strong, but will fall when tribulation and persecution come. So just like Joshua pretended to be beaten before the Canaanites to lure them into a trap, could Satan have picked up this strategy and is now using not only an obvious threat, but is also pretending to be beaten through an embarrassingly weak Biden administration and these false promises of a coming downfall of Jezebel and false eschatology like post-millennialism that gives a false hope of a coming victory and great awakening, which is really all false prophecy, to draw Christians out into the open and lure them into a pursuit of the flesh that makes them drop their spiritual guard, leave the protection of the spiritual city, and pridefully charge into a spiritual trap? I would say yes. And that this has been the devil's strategy for a long time now, with all of this exposure of the New World Order Great Reset agenda, of which this LGBT and wokeness stuff is merely a part. And this is what I want to start talking about now, is how blatantly obvious and weak this LGBT movement is, and how the devil is using an easy victory to puff up undiscerning Christians and feed them false hope and pride and self-righteousness. Now, to be clear, this LGBT movement does have many people held captive to it. But when we step back and look at the whole picture, we'll realize that this is not something that's deceiving the entire world or even half of it. It's not even deceiving most of the unsaved world. As I'm going to show you guys, the LGBT movement has gotten so extreme, so blatantly immoral, that much of the unsaved population is now coming against it, which lines up with this idea of an obvious frontal attack and using the strategy of pretending to be beaten to give a false hope of victory. Because this extreme leftism is an enemy that even basic human logic can expose as nefarious and deranged. So it's a very fragile enemy. And I'm going to show you guys just how fragile it is. What is a woman? Can you tell me that? <laughs> well, you're at the Women's March. You must have some idea. Please, if, if one person could tell me what a woman is. You are not here for women. We ask you to leave. What is that? A woman is not anything in particular. There is not one particular thing. It could be many things to many people. Some women have penises, right? Some men have vaginas. I like scented candles. And I've watched Sex in the City. Yeah. How do I know if, if I'm a woman? That's a great question. You're not a scientist. You're not a gender studies major. No. How do you know that you're a man? I guess because I got a dick. Can a man become a woman? <laughs> I'm not a woman, so I, I can't really answer that. Women only know what women are. Are you a uh, cat? No. Can you tell me what a cat is? Do you want to tell us what a woman is? This 95-minute documentary is from author, speaker, and podcast host Matt Walsh. He also has a book by the same name, and he travelled across America and 
other parts of the world seeking to answer that key question? Well, it starts with just recognizing that gender ideology is this pervasive, toxic influence in our culture across the world, across the Western world anyway, and uh, and also realizing that, you know, in, in spite of the fact that it's been so success, successful in claiming so many people's minds, um, it is really quite hollow at its core. And uh, it seemed to me, you know, going back years that just a couple of questions really bring down the whole house of cards, starting with the question, which is in the title of the movie, of course, uh, what is a woman? If you can't define what, a word, what the word woman is, then nothing that the gender ideologues say makes any sense. None of the claims that they make make any sense if they can't define the term. And uh, as we discovered filming the documentary, they, they certainly cannot define the term. Well, I'm not even talking about social context. I'm just, I'm just trying to start by getting to the truth, you know. Yeah, I mean, I'm really uncomfortable with that language of, like, getting to the truth. Again, in social why, why life... Is that, why is that uncomfortable? Because that, it sounds actually deeply transphobic to me. Um, and the if truth? You, and if you keep probing, we're going to stop the interview. I, if I probe about what the truth is? You keep invoking the word truth, which is condescending and rude. I'm saying how to is, you... How is the word truth condescending and rude? Why don't you tell me what your truth is, and you're walking on... 30 seconds more of the nice before I get up. I mean, how can somebody be so offended by truth, by the word truth, by the pursuit of truth? Yeah, it, it was a challenge sometimes. Sometimes a challenge not to laugh in their face. Sometimes a challenge not to scream at the, the outrageous, ridiculous things I'm being told. But what you just heard there, that, that really, almost every conversation with these people eventually devolves into some version of that. It, 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 you know, you get away from gender and pretty soon you're getting into, well, what is truth? Is there a truth? Wh whose reality are we talking about? I mean, I had that, that, it, that mm. kind of interaction so many times because what you find out is that at, at base, at bottom, all this gender ideology stuff, it's really a war on truth. It's really, um, uh, you know, really comes down to yes. relativism and the belief that uh, that we all get our own truth and our own reality. And I think that's what that's ultimately what they're trying to defend, I think. So first up, Matt Walsh, who's with The Daily Wire, uh, recently released his documentary called What is a Woman? And it's really taken off. Um, his whole channel, in fact, has really blown up this year. Um, I haven't seen the film, but I've seen the trailer and some clips and it really does reveal how demented and sick the mentality behind the LGBT movement is. The point being, this is a very easy enemy for mankind to hate. Uh, you do not need to be a true believer and dwelled by the Holy Spirit to see through the very thin veil, if there's a veil at all, of the woke movement. In fact, I think as the New Age and the False Prophets say, the veil is being lifted. Here's a clip of Matt Walsh talking about one of the more disturbing interviews he had for the documentary. Children believe in Santa Claus. So, like, what do they know about reality? If a, if a child is four years old and believes that not only Santa Claus is real, but that fairies and dragons and it lives appropriately in this kind of fantasy world, and then the boy says that I'm a girl, that claim exists within the same fantasy world. This is just imagination. This is a kid who just doesn't, who doesn't understand the distinction between fantasy and reality. Um, so how can they make these determinations? But then again, as, as we as found there, Michelle wouldn't even affirm that Santa doesn't exist. So I, that was, I was unclear about that also. Like, what, are you, do you actually think that Santa exists? What, what's happening? But it's, 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 as you're talking to these people, it's like your own, you, you feel yourself going slightly insane. So it was a pretty bewildering exchange there, but it only gets weirder from here. Let's keep watching. Male gametes. That's what makes me male. No, your, your sperm don't make you male. Then what does? It's a constellation. In reality. In truth. Okay. Whose truth are we talking about? The same truth that says we're sitting in this room right now, you and I. No, you're not listening. If I, if I see a chicken laying eggs and I say that's a female chicken laying eggs, did I assign Female, or am I just observing a physical reality that's happening in the world? Does a chicken have gender identity? Does a chicken cry? Well, a Does chi a chicken commit suicide? Let's frame it. With... Because you're talking, you're trying well, a chicken to... chicken has sex, like any, like any biological organism. A chicken has organism. an assigned gender, but a chicken doesn't have a gender identity. So we assign female to chickens when they lay eggs? That's a, we that's... assume they're female if they lay eggs. That right there will uh, go down for me as maybe one of the most... Uh, probably... 
and, and every other thing make, that makes it on this particular list is also happened in the film, but certainly one of the most outrageous uh, exchanges I've ever had with anybody. And of course, see, this, this is what happens when you start asking questions to, to, the, to the gender, to the proponent of gender ideology, is um, they, you know, they start, they end up backing themselves into various corners and they have to make um, increasingly more wild sort of claims to get themselves out of the corners that they've backed themselves into. And then finally, of course, we get to the, the question, which is the question I ask uh, everyone, and uh, which is, what is a woman? And probably it's not going to surprise you by now that she doesn't exactly have an answer for it, but let's, uh, let's listen to what she comes up with. So we're going on this journey. Boys can be girls, girls can be boys. Men can be women, women can be men. It makes me wonder, what, what is a woman? What is a woman? A woman is someone who claims that as their identity. It could be many things to many people. Hmm. That was her answer. Well, a woman is anyone. And that was, by the way, not to give any spoilers away, but that is the answer from the left to the question, which is a non-answer. It's the same thing as not answering it at all. But that is, that is the answer. A woman is someone who says they're a woman. And of course, to everyone who gives me that answer in the film, I have the follow-up. Well, a woman is someone who identifies as a woman. What are they identifying as? And around and around we go. Because they don't have an answer to the question. So the insanity of it is really being laid bare here. And more and more people are seeing the insanity of it. And what was interesting is that Matt Walsh said that one of the main aims in making the documentary and doing these interviews was to let the trans movement hang itself, as he put it. Don't go at them too hard, just ask the right questions and let the movement hang itself. And that's exactly what they do in this documentary, and pretty much everywhere else, uh, like all over TikTok and other social media sites. You let these people talk and get enough people to see it, they will hang themselves, so to speak. And that's exactly what they're doing. Because this entire movement is so clearly based on pure emotion and even mental illness. And that's not meant as an insult. Many of these people are clearly mentally ill. And just to be clear, I'm not using mental illness to excuse sin. Uh, many people use the term mental illness to divert away from the role of sin and the spiritual component, but that's not how I'm using it. I don't see sin and mental illness as mutually exclusive. But you don't necessarily need the discernment of the Holy Spirit to recognize that someone is not right in the head, um, at least not in the more extreme cases. And that's why I think Christians are seriously overreacting in thinking that this kind of stuff is part of the coming beast system. And there are many Christians who actually do think that, as I'll show you guys uh, near the end of the video. This is harlot Jezebel type stuff. This will not stand up to scrutiny. And the crazier it gets, and the more people see the craziness of it, the more it's going to wear out its welcome with people. And the more the false light will grow and be emboldened in its self-righteous crusade against all this stuff. And something really interesting I discovered in the reviews for Walsh's documentary that further shows just how mentally fragile this movement really is, is that there's been an unprecedented lack of official reviews for it. Um, so here's the Rotten Tomatoes page for What is a Woman? And at the time of taking this screenshot, it only had four official reviews after being out for almost two months. I've never heard of that before, um, at least not with a film this well known. They're not refusing to review it because they don't know about it. They clearly know about it. And that's why it still didn't have a score because four reviews is not nearly enough for it to have an official score but it had over 5,000 audience reviews with a 97% audience score, which is really, really high. Um, I've never seen this large of a gap between the audience score and number of reviews versus the official score and reviews. And what's interesting about this low review number is that typically what would happen with a conservative documentary like this is that liberal reviewers would at least watch it and then just give it a low score. They would pan it. But with this film, they haven't even been willing to watch it and have been very, very slow to even acknowledge the film, which really says something. It's like they're too scared to watch it. They can't take it. You know, it triggers them too much because 
they know deep down that it exposes the darkness of their worldview. And they can't even stand to sit through the film, let alone try and devote some mental energy to you know, write a well-thought-out criticism of it. So this is clearly not a movement that will stand the test of time. Now, I'm not saying that this stuff will completely die out, but I do think that there's going to be a pretty large recalibration in the near future uh, where things are really dialed back from the extremes that they've gone to these past couple years. And people start realizing that the woke movement went too far, especially with its push on children, where drag queens are coming in and you know reading to kids. I don't think that's the future. I think the future, and really the ultimate future as far as the Beast Kingdom goes, looks more like the movement that's exposing and opposing this kind of stuff. That's why I said in a post recently that the people exposing the gay agenda are more in line with the coming beast system than those pushing it. And I know some people didn't like that statement and said that I was overgeneralizing. But I wasn't overgeneralizing. Um, overgeneralizing is when you draw a conclusion or make a prediction based on one instance. right? You see one instance or one example of something and then base a whole theory on that one example. Uh, but that's not what I did at all. This is a phenomenon that I've been studying for a long time. Uh, that statement was not based on one instance. It's based on years of research and many, many examples. It might be a general statement that doesn't necessarily apply in every instance, but that doesn't make it an overgeneralization. Okay, there's a difference between a general statement and an overgeneralization. An overgeneralization is almost never correct because it's not based on enough evidence. It's only based on one, uh, one example. But a general statement can often be correct. In fact, most of the time, that's really all we have to work with because there's always going to be some exceptions to the rule. You know, for example, if I say men struggle with lust more than women, that's a general statement that's not necessarily going to apply in literally every case, but it's still true. Right In general, men struggle with lust more than women. But it doesn't mean that every single man on earth struggles with lust more than every single woman on earth. That's not what's meant or communicated by that statement. It's speaking to the big picture and the general tendencies of men and women. And it's a statement that's based on many, many instances, not just one. And so when I say the people who are exposing and opposing the LGBT agenda are more in line with the coming beast system than those pushing it, that's a completely true statement. And I hope more and more people will begin to recognize that sooner rather than later. The beast kingdom is going to look much more like the Great Awakening than the Great Reset. And when you look at the entire landscape of the kind of people who are exposing and opposing the LGBT agenda, it's undeniable that in general, they are much more representative of what the beast kingdom will end up being. Jesus warned in Matthew 24, 24, that false Christs and false prophets will arise to deceive even the elect if it were possible. But none of this leftist LGBT great reset stuff qualifies as a deception powerful enough to deceive the elect if it were possible. The false prophets, the true false prophets, okay, if I can use that, that phrase, are on the Christian right speaking against this woke agenda. They're not working at Disney or the World Economic Forum. The false prophets who talk about having visions and words from the Lord are the most vehement opponents of the woke agenda. So if we take Christ's warning to heart and really ask ourselves, where is the deception that's so powerful it would deceive even the elect if it were possible going to come from? Well, we'd have to say it's going to come at least primarily from the crowd opposing and exposing these cultural evils, not the ones pushing them. And I think Christians are a bit too preoccupied with exposing Disney and Hollywood and Marvel and the woke agenda and the satanic music industry and aren't warning the church about the dangerous movement that's rising up to oppose all these things. Nothing gives a good boost to the self-righteous ego, like spending time talking about how wicked Disney or Hollywood is. If you spend enough time looking into that stuff, you're going to start to feel not so evil. You know, kind of like the Pharisee in Luke 18, who thought he was righteous because he wasn't as bad as those people, right?
And we need to keep in mind that when the beast rises, he's going to be making war against something. And it's not just the saints. He's also going to go to war against Babylon. And I think that's what Christians are ultimately participating in exposing when they expose things like the gay or LGBT or Great Reset Agenda without realizing what they're exposing. They think they're exposing the coming beast kingdom when really they're exposing the harlot, the enemy that the beast will destroy. Again, that's why the Seven Mountain Mandate teachers always talk about invading Babylon. Because what they're building is not Christ's kingdom, but a counterfeit kingdom that will invade and eventually destroy Babylon under the pretense, the spiritual delusion, that God's kingdom has finally come and destroyed the evil satanic kingdom. And that's why they're going to cry peace and safety near the end of the tribulation after the harlot is destroyed. Because they will think that Satan's kingdom has finally been destroyed and the millennial kingdom is about to start. And that's when they're going to be in for a rude awakening when Christ appears on the clouds. Sean Foyt is another example. All he exposes is the leftist agenda. And he even calls out Babylon on his social media, as I'm showing here. Babylon is what the whole Dominionist Seven Mountain Mandate movement has its sights set on. Uh, same with the New Age and Truther communities. That's what they've been set on exposing and destroying for decades. Babylon. Not the beast, but Babylon. Uh, the conspiracy theorist Bill Cooper, who I've you know praised in the past, but have long since realized that he was uh, part of the false light too. That's why he has a series called Mystery Babylon, where he exposes the Babylonian religion. The Truther community, Alice Bailey, Hitler, the New Age, the Dominionist and Seven Mountain Mandate movements, they're all aligned in their war against Babylon, which is what the beast destroys. And that's why I take this so seriously in cautioning Christians against getting too deep in this culture war against the left and exposing Disney and Hollywood and the Great Reset. The Great Awakening versus the Great Reset is a prelude, a dress rehearsal, if you will, to the beast war against Babylon the harlot. Jack Hibbs is another example. Uh, he's also been calling out Babylon by name. Uh, he did a couple of sermon series recently on Revelation 17 and 18, uh, which is where Babylon is described in detail. And I found the name of the second series particularly interesting. It's called En Route to Babylon, Mankind's Final Stand. And what he means there is mankind's final stand against God. And this is something that is really, really prevalent now in modern prophecy teachings. The conflation of the beast and Babylon. Many, many pastors and teachers will often use the beast and Babylon as interchangeable terms, as if they're different terms for the same thing. And in fact, something I've noticed is that Christians will use the term Babylon more than they will the beast. And that's a potentially very dangerous teaching and idea. Uh, more on that later, but... The beast is not Babylon, and Babylon is not the beast. Okay, There's a reason why the scripture says that the beast destroys Babylon. If the beast and Babylon are synonymous for the same thing, then how can the beast destroy itself? It almost seems like Revelation 17, 16 is the most overlooked and misunderstood verse in all of prophecy. Contrary to what Jack Hibbs says, Babylon will not be mankind's final stand against God. The beast system will be. It's the beast, the false prophet, and their kings who will stand against Christ at Armageddon, not Babylon. Babylon will already have been destroyed by the time the beast meets Christ at Armageddon. It's unfortunate how clueless Jack Hibbs is about where he's ultimately leading his congregation. And as I pointed out a few times, uh, Hibbs has been promoting ecumenical unity in the name of standing against tyranny. Okay, he did an interview a couple years ago with James Robeson, a false televangelist and friend of Kenneth Copeland, and it was titled, Christians, We Must Unite in This War. Christians, we must unite in this war against tyranny and evil. That's going to be the battle cry of the beast system, guys. So this rebellion against Babylon is growing, and we're already seeing a prelude to the coming global unity against the Babylonian system which the Great Reset and Woke stuff would be a manifestation of. Okay, this is all part of the buildup to the rise of the beast. 
And speaking of Jack Hibbs, he was part of a special back in February on TBN, uh, which is Trinity Broadcasting Network, uh, which is chock full of false teachers, called Identity and Gender, hosted by Charlie Kirk. And it was about the spread of LGBT and uh, critical race theory and all these leftist things. Uh, John MacArthur joined in as well, uh, who's also been on a very dangerous trajectory the past couple years. And we'll be looking at some footage from this special in just a bit. But MacArthur's participation in this is another example of the growing unity between the NAR and reform camps against the woke secularist culture. This is what always happens, is ecumenicism in the name of fighting against secularism. And we're seeing the same thing today on a very large scale in America and around the world. So don't be fooled by the American gospel films. I know they have some truth in them, but reform teachers are more than willing to lock arms with heretics if it means saving the country. And Vody Bauckham is another example. Jeff Durbin, too. And there are many, many others. But I think Christians who act like this LGBT stuff is just going to take over the world and it's uh, going to be part of the beast system, are not being very discerning and could possibly be falling for the false light trap. Because this LGBT woke movement is clearly made up of people who are incredibly mentally weak and even mentally ill in many cases. The false light, great awakening, red pill side by comparison is very powerful. It has much more logic and facts and mental stability on its side. That's why the delusion is going to get so strong, because the people swept up in this movement think that they're on the side of God fighting against the evil satanic kingdom. But here's something interesting. It says in Revelation 18.2 that Babylon the harlot has become a dwelling place for demons. In other words, the beast kingdom is going to make war against a demonic system and a satanic stronghold on the earth. And that's when the saints will be lumped in with that demonic system and be called Beelzebub, um, as Christ warned about in Matthew chapter 10, where he's warning his disciples about the coming persecution, uh, which is a picture of the persecution that the saints will face during the tribulation. If you look at Matthew 10, 16 through 25, you're going to notice a lot of the same language that Christ uses in Matthew 24, where he talks about the tribulation period. So the saints are going to be lumped in with the quote-unquote demonic system of the harlot because we won't take the mark of the beast and will therefore be accused of being part of that demonic system and will be called Beelzebub just like Christ was by the Pharisees. And the culmination of the beast's war will be the destruction of a demonic city. This is why I've been saying for years that Gnosticism is rising up to fight Satanism. Gnosticism is fighting against the obvious Anton LaVey, Church of Satanism type stuff. And the New Age especially has a very uh, naive view of what demons are. They think demons are these overly dark, scary-looking things that release negative energy and plot global domination, like the depiction of Emperor Zerg from the Lightyear film with the glowing red eyes and horns, or like the demons in the Doom video game series. That's how the world views demons. And so it's concerning when Christians who should understand that Satan disguises himself as an angel of light are so hyper-focused on exposing the obvious black magic inverted pentagram Satanism and sort of fall into a new age view of spiritual warfare where it just becomes about fighting against the dark Satanic agenda and only painting the left Jezebel great reset side as quote-unquote the demonic side yes all that stuff is demonic but that doesn't mean it's going to be part of the beast kingdom okay, remember the beast destroys babylon a dwelling place for demons which should hopefully start to recontextualize this growing preoccupation that we see everywhere with the demonic agenda behind the lgbt movement i hope that puts that into proper perspective if it hasn't already I've been seeing this everywhere, this association of Disney and demons. Everyone's talking about the demonic nature of Disney. For example, here's a thumbnail from a video about Disney from Answers in Genesis, which is the ministry run by Ken Ham, 
called How Disney is Subtly Poisoning Your Children, uh, which is a problematic title because, as we've seen, none of this is subtle. But you can see the uh, demonic imagery that they used. Mickey Mouse with red glowing eyes. And Ken Ham has yoked himself with Kirk Cameron, who's uh, given one of his uh, American Campfire Revival presentations at Ken Ham's Ark Encounter. So Answers in Genesis is aligning with the Great Awakening and American Revival movement. Uh, here's another example. This is the thumbnail for Lance Walnow's video about Disney. Disney, Demons, and Divine Intervention. And then here's a poster at one of Sean Foyt's Disney rallies that says, Disney is demonic. And then Sean Foyt himself labeled Disney and the LGBT movement as demonic in an interview that he did about the rallies he was holding. Even just normal Americans, they don't like this stuff. They don't want this stuff taught to their kids. And I don't know why the left is so obsessed with talking to kids about sex. It's perverted, it's demonic, and most of America is rejecting it. And I think you're gonna see that happen come November this year. Not surprisingly, Alex Jones and Infowars have also taken up the exposing Disney cause. And they're also appealing to this same kind of packaging. Um, as you can see in the thumbnail for this interview with a former Disney executive, it says Disney's Demons. And we're going to look at that uh, interview later on. So this is a trend that's picking up speed. The New Agers, the Truthers, the Great Awakening people calling out demons. And I'm sure you guys will start noticing it more and more yourselves. Christian and Truther channels everywhere are exposing the Satanism, the demonic nature of secular and leftist culture. This is ultimately building toward a very unfortunate end. It's a Gnostic rebellion against Satanism. The false light exposing the dark side. The devil is associating this blatant demonic imagery with the left to deceive Christians into thinking that you know, they're learning Satan's secrets. And this is one of the common themes in this Disney LGBT leftist exposure is always labeling it as demonic. And the problem with that is that it's true, right? But many Christians have a difficult time understanding that just because something is true doesn't mean that it's not being used for deception. The most powerful deceptions have tons of truth mixed in with them. The beast kingdom destroys the dwelling place for demons. The beast will come as a false Christ, a false second coming, to quote-unquote stop the demonic agenda, which will culminate in the destruction of Babylon, the dwelling place for demons, uh, which I believe is Jerusalem. That's why Zionist Jews are so often exposed as the primary quote-unquote puppet masters behind these agendas. And so the more that this Jezebelic type stuff gets exposed, the more emboldened the false light is going to get in its Gnostic war against, quote-unquote, the demonic realm or the satanic kingdom. And I would say, God, I'm going up into the high places, and I'm going to tear the devil's kingdom down. They're going to get more confident in their arrogant pronouncements against Satan and his angels. Uh, like Peter and Jude say, the false prophets and teachers who... Um, arrogantly rebuke the spiritual realm. Okay, these people aren't afraid like these liberal movie reviewers who can't even stand to sit through what is a woman. Guys like Matt Walsh and Steven Crowder and Ben Shapiro look like prophets and apostles in comparison to these LGBT people who spin out of control and fold under the weight of the basic logic that's presented to them. But again, that's the point. Imagine how powerful and legitimate the false prophets in Christ of the actual tribulation period will look in the midst of all the chaos and craziness that will be happening. False Christs and apostles don't arise from the chaos or as part of the chaos, but rather to oppose the chaos in opposition to it. And the surrounding chaos will make them look more powerful than they really are. And we're seeing that effect on display right now just to a lesser degree but it will get stronger. And ultimately, the beast will attempt to bring order out of the chaos largely caused by the harlot. The beast system is not going to be run by or filled with insane people. There's a difference between spiritual delusion and insanity. 
Now, obviously, someone who's insane is also spiritually deluded or deceived. But someone who's spiritually deceived is not necessarily insane. Matt Walsh is not an insane person at all. He's a very intelligent, uh, a very confident speaker, much more than I am, that's for sure. But he is spiritually deceived. He's not a true believer. He's a Catholic. He's part of this false light rebellion. And he's very confident in himself, just like Jehu. He's a Jehu, one of the many Jehus right now, who sees the insanity and the evil of Jezebel and wants to throw her down. In fact, here's the thumbnail of a video of his called Resist the Perversion, Join the Rebellion. So he's using this terminology of rebellion too. And you can see him surrounded by all these Jezebelic type characters. And that's what's brewing right now is a rebellion against Jezebel. And this rebellion includes not just conservatives, uh, which is one of the big indications that the LGBT movement is way too obvious and has overplayed its hand. Because not only are non-Christian conservatives and patriots upset about this stuff, but even left-leaning pro-LGBT people are against the extremism of the woke movement. For example, Caitlyn Jenner, the original hero of the LGBT movement, has gotten sick of wokeness. Uh, this is what he said on Fox News back in March about the issue of transgender athletes in women's sports. Um, and it's been kind of all over. Uh, but I'm getting so tired of this woke world. Um, I've done so much for the trans community bringing this issue forward put millions of dollars through my foundation into groups and work so hard to do it. I don't think anybody deserves that. But, you know, that's the bigger story is uh, the woke world is out there and we're fighting it and people have to stand up. So Jenner is obviously not anti-LGBT in an individual sense. You know, if you want to be transgender, that's fine in his view. The issue for him is when transgenderism starts to negatively affect others. And having transgender women, you know, which are really men, competing in women's sports, that's crossing the line for him because that's robbing women of their opportunities. And he spoke out against that and was subsequently attacked by the LGBT movement. And that's what has kind of made him fed up with woke culture. And it's significant that he said that we have to stand up and fight the woke world. Because that's essentially what mainstream Christianity is saying, too. That our main spiritual battle is against the woke agenda. And we have to rise up together and push back against it. Another example is Kara Dansky. Uh, she was on the Identity and Gender special on TBN with Charlie Kirk and Jack Hibbs and John MacArthur. She describes herself as a radical feminist. And she's the president of the U.S. chapter of Women's Declaration International, uh, which is a very liberal feminist organization. So she is very left-wing. And yet she is also very against the transgender movement for many of the same reasons that conservatives like Matt Walsh and Charlie Kirk are. In fact, in some ways, she's especially affected by the transgender movement because as a radical feminist, to undermine the very identity of womanhood as the trans movement has is to undermine her entire cause as a feminist, right? You can't fight for women's rights if you can't even define what a woman is. And she had some very interesting things to say in her interview with Charlie Kirk. Here are some of the highlights from that interview. Kara Dansky, a self-described radical feminist. Is that fair? Yes, absolutely. And you have some opinions on this transgender topic. I do, I do. And I write all about them in a book called The Abolition of Sex, How the Transgender Agenda Harms Women and Girls. What's so wrong with the transgender movement? Why would a radical feminist care about that? Yeah, so, I mean, radical feminism is all about protecting the rights, privacy, and safety of women and girls. And we cannot do that as a movement if we cannot define the category of women and girls to exclude males. Several decades ago, out of the academy, out of coming out of postmodernism, there was something called queer theory. And what queer theory essentially did was it decided that biological sex is not a binary. And it wanted to make that mainstream. But if it tried to go mainstream by telling average, ordinary American citizens across the political spectrum that sex isn't real, it would have failed spectacularly because all Americans 
know how babies are made. And so they made up a word and they, the word that they made up is transgender. And that word has done a remarkable job in persuading Americans, again, across the political spectrum, that there is some discrete, coherent category of people called transgender people who are somehow neither male or female, and it's just not true. Today, and I know that it might be difficult to believe, but there are a lot of lesbians and gay men who are saying no to including the T in the LGBT acronym. And they're very frustrated because for lesbians and gay men, Biological sex is really relevant. You can't protect same-sex attraction if there's no such thing as actual sex. Because if you ask a lot of lesbian, gay, and bisexual people if they find any common ground with TQIAA++ whatever, what those, those nobody are. does. Okay. <laughs> but they will say no. They will say no. That is not, I don't know what that is, but that is not us. That is not me trying to fight for my rights as a same-sex attracted person. Opposition to gender identity in the UK is mainly coming from rank and file members of the Labour Party. And their media will talk about it. Here, most of the opposition to gender identity is coming from the right, or it appears to be coming from the right. Certainly in Congress, that's true, and in state legislatures. But there are rank and file Democrats all over the country who are so fired up and angry about this, but they don't get a voice because the media will not cover our angle. I am not in favor of people taking medically unnecessary cosmetic surgeries or extremely harmful hormones. I'm not a fan of that. If an adult wants to do that, there's nothing I can do to get in their way. But that doesn't mean that anyone changes sex. Adults are one thing, but it's going to children now. Children are being taught in schools as early, as far as I'm aware, as early as kindergarten, that you can either be a girl or a boy. It's up to you. And a lot of times we're seeing incidents where teachers are, are doing what's called socially transitioning kids, which is referring to the kid by a different name, opposite sex pronouns, letting the kid use the opposite sex bathrooms without parental knowledge. So these kids are gravely confused. And of course, once these kids are told that they can be either a girl or a boy, you plant that idea in a kid's mind, a kid's gonna wanna do that. And so our young people are being put on puberty blockers using off-label uses, and it's awful. We do not know the long-term consequences of these drugs, except that we do know that a lot of these kids are getting sterilized um, at, at an age at which they ought not to be able to consent to such a thing. It's really terrible. The Women's Liberation Front, on whose board I served from 2016 to 2020, is suing the state for its explicit policy, which Governor Newsom enacted in 2020, to allow convicted male prisoners and rapists to be housed in women's prisons on the basis of their so-called gender identity. I do not understand why this is not a national scandal. And it's not just California, that's where the lawsuit is pending. In Washington state, not pursuant to state law, but pursuant to the Department of Corrections policy, there is a man who goes by the name Princess, who was convicted, who was convicted of raping a 12-year-old girl being held in the women's prison. Please do not write this off as the lunacy left, you know, in California and Washington, it's happening all over the country. I've lost a lot of people in my life. I basically can't get work in the criminal justice reform community anymore. Really? Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> because I have said publicly that men aren't women. This is just the reality of what happens when you are a feminist on the left and you start to speak out about these things. You lose your career, you can lose friends and family. This is routine for women on the left who speak out. So this is a radical feminist that denies transgenderism completely. She even puts air quotes around the word transgender every time she says it because she doesn't believe that it's a legitimate category based in reality. She's also been very adamant and outspoken about her belief in the importance of not using transgender pronouns. She firmly believes this is not something that should be affirmed. Don't call women men and vice versa. She's very much against the entire philosophical basis of transgenderism, uh, which is based in something called queer theory, which she completely denies as invalid. And she's also against this growing trend of giving children puberty blockers just because they've decided to become trans, which is what that woman who uh, Matt Walsh was interviewing does. She gives uh, children puberty blocking drugs. So on the trans issue, she is completely aligned with Matt Walsh. The kinds of things that she talked about with Charlie Kirk ended up being covered by Matt Walsh in his What is a Woman documentary. I also found it interesting where she said that in the UK, 
the Labor Party, which is very left-wing, is the main one opposing the idea of gender identity. And her own organization, which again is very left-wing, very feminist, sued Governor Newsom of California. So there is widespread opposition to LGBT activism coming from the left itself. You know, as she said, there are a lot of gay men and women opposed to this. And she would know because she's in a position to be able to see that, you know, being the president of a large feminist organization and someone who is pro-gay rights herself and is in contact with many other pro-gay rights people. And if you think about it, if she's the president of this large feminist organization, that likely means that most of the women in her organization are also against transgenderism too, because, you know, they can stand being part of an organization whose president is against the LGBT movement. You know, we've already seen how uh, mentally fragile this movement is. They can't even stand to sit through Matt Walsh's documentary. So you know they're not going to be able to tolerate an anti-LGBT president. And as you can see here, uh, they've started an anti-LGBT petition that's been signed by over 400 organizations in 157 countries at the time of the airing of this program. So opposition to the LGBT movement is extremely widespread. It's not just coming from the right, and it's most definitely not just coming from the church. And Christians are not the only ones being persecuted or silenced by the LGBT movement. As you heard from Kara Dansky, uh, she's been censored and ostracized in a very extreme way. And so have many people just like her. Yet many false light Christian pastors and teachers have insisted that this is persecution from the rising beast system which is just an absurd notion the more you think about it. The Bible says that all people will worship the beast. Not all people will be aligned against the beast. And alliances against this LGBT stuff are growing and growing. What I find so fascinating is you're a radical feminist, I'm a Christian conservative, and we both so agree on this because we believe in material reality. What can be done? What's okay. the battle plan? Well, that was a great segue. Thank so you. I have a present for you okay. and, your, and your team. I made these. I got so frustrated one day. <laughs> I, I sat down it. at my laptop and I just made these. Hand these out, leave them around, put them on community billboards. This so is what I've been doing. Can I read it? Yeah. It says, Psst, there's no such thing as transgender. It's okay to say so. And you don't have to use preferred pronouns either pass it on. If people could get this message and feel empowered to say that and to share that with another one of their colleagues or friends, we can do this. And it's going to take Americans across the political aisle. It's I'm absolutely to I totally agree with you. Yes. And I just want to thank you. Uh, you're, you're such a persuasive voice on this. And I have been looking and looking and looking for feminists to start to rise up on this issue. It's these interesting times really build these fun alliances. So thank you so much. Definitely. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Another example of leftist opposition to the LGBT movement is Bill Maher. Uh, many of you are familiar with him. Uh, he's a longtime atheist and liberal comedian and uh, political commentator. And he also feels that the woke movement has gone too far, uh, both with its attack on free speech and its push on children. Maher's not only been poking fun at woke culture this year, uh, but is actually taking a very strong moral stand against it. Like Karadansky, he's also extremely opposed to uh, giving young children puberty blockers uh, just because they want to identify as trans. Uh, so here are some clips of Mars' criticism of the LGBT movement from earlier this year, along with some commentary from Ben Shapiro. I really believe that this is going to be the death of the modern Democratic Party if they continue along these lines. Because it is one thing to say to people, you need to give us more power and we'll solve your economic problems. Increasingly, people don't like the sound of that. But the thing that people have never liked the sound of is we need to train your kids in a bunch of radical genderized nonsense because we, the elitists, understand that true human happiness lies only and solely in the fulfillment of the sexual impulse, which we will broaden out to include all human beings screwing all other human beings and identifying as everything up to and including fictional characters and cats. I think we've reached the breaking point. On this. So the bleeding indicator of them reaching the breaking point is Bill Maher. So Bill Maher is like mainstream center left 1996 Democrat. That's what Bill Maher is. I mean, I've interviewed him. I know Bill. We're friendly. Okay, so Bill Maher on his show last week, he pointed out that the trans agenda to experiment on kids and to teach your kindergartners that they can be members of the opposite sex, that they magically can become members of the, that is a lie, it is not true, and it is a social contagion that is damaging children. 
Here is Bill Maher speaking what is just basic truth and would have been acknowledged as basic truth three years ago. But now your elitist class is telling you that if you say it, it means that you're a very bad person. Here's Bill Maher. I'm just saying that when things change this much, this fast, people are allowed to ask, what's up with that? All the babies are in the wrong bodies? Was there a mix up at the plant? Like with Captain Crunch's oops, old berries? It wasn't that long ago when adults asked a kid, what do you want to be when you grow up? They meant what profession? <laughs> I'm happy for LGBT folks that we now live in an age where they can live their authentic lives openly. And we should always be mindful of respecting and protecting. But someone needs to say it. Not everything's about you. And it's okay to ask questions about something that's very new and involves children. The answer can't always be that anyone from a marginalized community is automatically right. Trump card, mic drop, end of discussion. Because we're literally experimenting on children. Maybe that's why Sweden and Finland have stopped giving puberty blockers to kids. Because we just don't know much about the long-term effects. Although common sense should tell you that when you reverse the course of raging hormones, there's going to be problems. We do know it hinders the development of bone density, which is kind of important if you like having a skeleton. <laughs> Fertility and the ability to have an orgasm seem also to be affected. This isn't just a lifestyle decision, it's medical. Weighing trade-offs is not bigotry. If we can't admit that in certain enclaves there is some level of trendiness to the idea of being anything other than straight, then this is not a serious science-based discussion. It's a blow being struck in the culture wars using children as cannon fodder. I don't understand parents who won't let their nine-year-old walk to the corner without a helmet, an EpiPen, and a GPS tracker. <laughs> And God forbid their lips touch dairy, but... <laughs> but hormone blockers and genital surgery, fine. <laughs> I mean, the, Bill Maher is saying this stuff. Again, you elitists, you can continue preaching what you're preaching, economically, socially, it ain't gonna hold. And I agree, this isn't gonna hold. If Bill Maher and Caitlyn Jenner and a radical feminist like Kara Dansky all have a problem with it, it's not the devil's ultimate endgame. There is large-scale opposition to this kind of education and agenda being pushed on young children, especially when it ends up leading to minors having sex chain surgery and young children being given puberty blockers that could permanently damage them. So there are many left-wing people who are against the woke movement. Because this is not the kind of wisdom that requires the Holy Spirit or the Word of God to possess. People in general understand that children are impressionable and shouldn't rush to make huge decisions. And most people understand that messing with hormones is generally not a good idea, especially at such a young age. Because the younger someone is, the more extreme the long-term effects can be. And as we've seen, the LGBT movement is even being criticized for being anti-feminist because it destroys the notion of womanhood. And it's also being criticized for being anti-gay because it destroys the notion of gender or sex completely. I've also heard gay people take issue with LGBT extremists because uh, they'll see an effeminate young boy, for example. And instead of saying that he might be gay, they'll just say, well, he's that way because he's really a girl. So the more normal gay people, if I can say that, are feeling like the trans movement is hijacking children for their cause. This is how ridiculous the LGBT movement has gotten. It's even being perceived as anti-gay and anti-feminist by gays and feminists themselves. It's cannibalizing itself. And this is why I keep trying to reiterate, it doesn't take spiritual discernment to be against wokeness. Again, going back to Adolf Hitler, who was a false light type. He was against the woke culture of his day during the Weimar Republic. That's what he was fighting, cultural immorality, moral decline, and communism. 
He was also fighting the Satanic Jews, which once again ties in with Jerusalem being Babylon and the dwelling place for demons. And the demonic woke agenda of our day has gotten so overtly insane that it's not going to hold, at least not the extreme parts of it. And there's a very concerning anti-woke false light alliance that's been forming and rising up against this demonic left that I think Christians should really be paying more attention to. This is not a spiritual war. It's a culture war. Okay, Bill Maher used that term in the clips that I just played. And he referenced the culture wars. And Christian leaders who keep calling out the woke stuff and forming alliances with questionable people to help call out the woke stuff are falling into this culture war trap. And I'm seeing this happen with ministries that are, you know, more quote unquote doctrinally sound. When you're hyper focused on the woke movement and you see that as the main enemy, when you see the woke agenda as the satanic agenda in terms of Revelation 13, this leads to the creation of alliances with questionable teachers. This rule has been without exception. And I mean it without exception. This is the greater deception that we need to be on guard against. And if you see the woke movement as the ultimate spiritual enemy with whom you are to go to war against, then you're inevitably going to see everyone who's against wokeness as either a spiritual comrade or a potential spiritual comrade. Because if you identify this as a spiritual war, then it just naturally follows that you're going to see people aligned against your spiritual enemy as your spiritual friend. And we're going to see more examples of that throughout this video. The anti-woke alliances that are forming all over the world right now are a precursor to the B-Systems unity against the harlot. I've seen this phenomenon play out with Jordan Peterson, for example. Many conservative Christian pastors have been hopeful and even a bit naive about Peterson's spiritual journey simply because he's so against modern liberalism and wokeness and globalism. But the problem with that is that to see being anti-liberal and anti-woke and anti-globalist as progress toward Christ is part of the Great Awakening mentality. Being anti-globalist can be just as much of a sign that someone is moving toward Gnosticism in the New Age. In fact, that's more often the case, which Peterson himself is a perfect example of. Uh, he just recently put out a video called Message to Muslims where he calls for interfaith cooperation and peace and urges Muslims to realize that they have more in common with Christians and Jews than not. And one thing I found particularly interesting with regard to everything that I've been talking about uh, on my channel for the past six years is how he said that we all need to realize, quote unquote, the real problem, as he puts it, is the satanic threat of tyranny, which we all need to unify against. Listen. Far more unites you with the other people of the book as your own prophet himself, peace be unto him, forthrightly said, than what divides you. You all believe, for example, in a book. You all believe, for example, in God and believe that you have an ultimate duty to that God. You are all followers of a prophetic tradition. And that is a tradition that unites the wisdom of the past with the vision and voice of those willing to see and speak truly and lovingly in the present. And you are all threatened, in a very real sense, by the system of vengeful Luciferian ideas that currently confronts all that is transcendent, traditional, and valuable on the sexual front, on the familial front, on the conceptual front, on the psychological and sociological front, and, in the final analysis, on the theological front. So, how about we all quit squabbling over trinkets and details and face the real problem? Thank you, all my Muslim listeners, watchers, and readers, for your kind attention and patience. I wish you well as you strive to become the light in the world that your faith truly demands. Let's see if we can unite as people of the book and negotiate our way toward the paradise that we might truly and jointly 
attain. So let's all set aside our petty differences, stop squabbling over the details, as he says, face the real threat of Satanism. You know, he said Luciferian, but he's using it as interchangeable with Satanic, and build a paradise. That's the bottom line message of the entire Great Awakening movement a united rebellion against satanic tyranny. And as many of you know, Peterson is a, a rising star within the conservative crowd. Uh, he's now joined with the Daily Wire, which is uh, Ben Shapiro's outlet, and has been one of the primary opponents of the whole woke movement over the past four to five years. And so what Peterson said here is a picture of what's coming. This growing Gnostic rebellion against Satanism and Jezebel, and tyranny, to build an enlightened paradise. The beast system is not going to be satanic, as the vast majority of people understand that term. The harlot which the beast destroys is a dwelling place for demons, which means the beast system is going to be a global revolution against Satanism, or at least what most people understand as Satanism. The beast system will destroy the headquarters, if you will, of Satanism, of demonic activity, which again is what Adolf Hitler rose up to fight against, Satanic Communism. He believed that the Jews and their international communist conspiracy was the greatest threat, and he called them Satanic, which again points to Jerusalem being the harlot that the beast destroys. And what's concerning is how much of the modern church is echoing Peterson's message about rebellion to Satanic tyranny being the most pressing issue that we all need to awaken to and unite against. As Jack Hibbs himself has said, that Christians need to unite in this war. And that's why we've been seeing Jack Hibbs align with more and more questionable teachers, ones that blatantly promote the Seven Mountain Mandate, like uh, Cheon and David Barton, who is good friends with Kenneth Copeland. And along this line of ecumenical rebellion to satanic tyranny, uh, Jack Hibbs made a post last November about Jordan Peterson saying, quote, he's awake and beginning to see. But what exactly is Peterson beginning to see? What is he awake to? Well, it seems that he's awake to the same thing that Alice Bailey and David Icke and Alex Jones and the New Age is awake to, the satanic threat of tyranny and the need for humanity to set aside their petty differences and unite. It's hard for me to really communicate how spiritually naive and irresponsible Jack Hibbs is. He should take this post down and repent of it, and step down as a pastor for promoting someone like Peterson as awake. But unfortunately, Jack Hibbs is far from the only one. Many Christians see democracy and political freedom as synonymous with the Bible. Obviously, Charlie Kirk is another one. He blasphemously calls that the good fight, fighting for America and political liberty. We got a treat for you. Four amazing college campus conservatives fighting the good fight on the front lines for liberty and freedom. The Constitution and the American dream all involved the Turning Point USA. So fighting the good fight is fighting for liberty, freedom, and the Constitution. That is the epitome of the modern day golden calf system. It's such a horrible perversion of the Word of God and what true faith and spiritual war is really about. If that's what the good fight is, then the Apostle Paul clearly failed because he did not advance the cause of political liberty. Not even for Christians, let alone for other people. But we know, according to 2 Timothy 4.7, that Paul did fight the good fight, and he did finish the race, and he kept the faith. Because earthly political freedom has absolutely nothing to do with the good fight. In fact, fighting the actual good fight of the faith means you have to completely give up your sense of freedom and autonomy and this notion that you deserve certain rights. But according to the logic of golden calf Christians like Charlie Kirk, democracy and constitutional liberty are synonymous with the Bible. And that's where you get this distorted notion that the Constitution is divinely inspired. And so based on that logic, if you're against globalism and totalitarianism, then you're at least somewhat awake or more open to the Bible than others. You know, you're taking a step in the right direction, because if you cherish political freedom, 
then you're within the ballpark of Christianity because the liberty and freedom that America stands for is a physical manifestation or representation of the same kind of liberty and freedom that Christ accomplished by setting the captives free from sin. Christ sets sinners free from sin, and America sets people free from tyranny. And the Great Awakening sees these concepts as part of the same spiritual struggle, uh, which contradicts what the Bible teaches, which is that suffering is what God uses to help us grow in our faith. We need suffering to fight the good fight. But people like Charlie Kirk and Jack Hibbs seem to think that pushing back suffering and persecution is part of the good fight. But over and over again throughout Scripture, we see the theme that suffering is used to help us grow in our faith. Right? Paul says in Philippians 3.10 that sharing in Christ's sufferings has helped him to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. And then Peter in 1 Peter 4, 1-2 says that suffering helps us to live for God instead of the passions of our flesh. I myself can attest to this. My own suffering has most definitely cleansed me of certain things and brought me closer to the Lord than I ever thought possible. But the modern Western church denies this and, and flips it around, basically saying that the removal of suffering through religious freedom is what will help grow and mature the church. It's a horribly blasphemous and idolatrous mixture of the Bible and political philosophy. It truly is the modern-day golden calf system that somewhat resembles the Bible and the worship of God. It's so very close and so very far at the same time. But what Charlie Kirk and Jack Hibbs and David Barton and Lance Wallnow and Jeff Durbin and others like them who push the idolatry of Americanism don't tell you is that what often drives rebellion to totalitarianism is a mentality that's fundamentally against what true biblical discipleship demands. They'll tell you that resisting tyranny is obedience to God, but won't tell you that many of the most famous rebels in history have been the most disobedient to God and were rebels because they saw the Bible as a tool of the tyranny that was oppressing them. In many cases, rebellion to tyranny has been led by people who outright hated the Bible and saw its God as the greatest tyrant of all. Some of the greatest revolutionary minds in history have been people who were adamantly against the Bible and the kind of doctrine and ideas it promotes. And that's true not only today within the Great Awakening and with people like David Icke and others steeped in New Ageism and Trutherism and Gnosticism, but it's been true throughout history. The doctrine of original sin, for example, was seen by many Enlightenment-era philosophers as the greatest hindrance to the progress of man. And a lot of what we're seeing today is a continuation and culmination of Enlightenment-era thinking. So the false light movement defines awakening as waking up to the globalist agenda and waking up to the power and authority that we have in fighting it. That's how New Agers and Truthers have defined it for decades. And it's how much of the Christian religious right today is defining it too. That's why Jack Hibbs said that Jordan Peterson is awake because Peterson is against totalitarianism and woke culture and promotes Western democratic values. And in Hibbs' mind, that's making a step in the direction of Christ. Uh, Hibbs even said something similar about Bill Maher because of Maher's criticisms of wokeness. Uh, look at this post. He said, hats off to Bill Maher, who's starting to see the light. Well, what light is Jack Hibbs talking about? The only true light is the light of the gospel. But as far as I can tell, Bill Maher is just as far away from the gospel as he's always been. Maher hasn't changed. It's culture around him that's changed. Bill Maher has simply stood still as the culture around him dramatically shifted. And all Maher is doing is standing against that dramatic shift in leftist culture. The light that Hibbs is saying that Bill Maher sees is the false light. Hibbs, who's uh, steeped in patriotism and the culture war mentality and who touts antichrist Gnostics like Thomas Jefferson as godly men, he thinks seeing the light is recognizing the evil of wokeness. 
which is right in line with how New Agers and Truthers define awakening. It's a complete Gnostic distortion of what true awakening is. The Gnostic awakening is about uh, waking up to the evil agenda being done to us, right? The evil material prison that's been imposed upon us. While true biblical awakening is waking up to our own sin and our own horribleness, right? And the light of the gospel that saves us. Bill Maher is not any closer to the light of the gospel just because he believes in free speech and doesn't believe children should be given puberty blockers. Bill Maher is simply waking up in the Gnostic sense. He's waking up to the evil agenda. And Jack Hibbs is acknowledging that as waking up in the biblical sense. In Jack Hibbs' mind, that's seeing the light because pro-free speech and anti-wokeness agree with the false light of Americanism and patriotism and freedom and the Great Awakening, which he so passionately defends. And since Hibbs sees the Great Reset and the globalist agenda as the B system, which is another key component of the Great Awakening deception, and it's what so many other pastors and teachers believe as well, I think his logic is that Bill Maher and Jordan Peterson have a good chance of not being deceived by the Antichrist because they're against woke culture and totalitarianism, right? So he thinks they're starting to wake up to Christ because they're against the satanic kingdom. It's incredibly naive. And Hibbs' mentality is very common among Christians today, trust me. And look at what else he said in the post about Bill Maher. He said, If in doubt, look and see what the progressive left is doing and then do the opposite and you'll know that's correct. So whatever the left is doing, just do the opposite and that's truth. I think that's one of the worst pieces of advice that a pastor can give. To use the left as some sort of reverse moral compass. Use the left's opposition to something as a basis or starting point for truth. According to that logic, since the left is against Christian nationalism, then I guess we should do the opposite and stand for Christian nationalism. I mean, if the left hates it, then it must be good, right? That's a horrible method or basis of discernment. God repeatedly warns in the Bible to not veer to the right or to the left, meaning that there are multiple ways that one can veer from the truth. There's not only one path to error. There are many, many paths to error and only one path to truth. And speaking of doing the opposite of whatever the left is doing, uh, that's really the whole theme of this video series is how there's this giant opposite reaction to the leftist agenda and how the deception coming from this opposite reaction is a much stronger and subtler deception than the deception coming from the left. Much of the world right now is looking at the Great Reset and doing the opposite, i.e. the Great Awakening, and believing that's the side of truth. But it's simply the right side of deception, the right-hand path. And what's so powerful and subtle about it is that people pushing the Great Awakening are more convinced than ever that what they're doing is godly and righteous and true because the left is against it, including things like patriotism and nationalism and rebellion to tyranny. These things are increasingly looking good and godly and righteous as a result of all this uh, you know, darkness being exposed and, and getting more prominent and stronger. If the left hates those things, they must be good, right? And that's why it's a more powerful deception, because it's pushing against, quote-unquote, Satanism and the Satanic kingdom, which again, in some way or another, links back to the harlot. And the opposite of Satanism must be godly, right? Well, if you followed that logic in 1930s and 1940s Germany, you would have supported the Nazi movement. Because that also rose up against satanic communism. So Jack Hibbs is implicitly promoting a Nazi mentality. I know that's an extreme statement, but it's absolutely true. And this is why I have an issue with calling the LGBT agenda deceptive. There is a level of deception, obviously. But how deceptive can this gender ideology be if an atheist liberal like Bill Maher has a problem with it? or radical feminists like Karadansky. Christian and conservative channels everywhere have been exposing the woke agenda. But does it really need to be exposed when Caitlyn Jenner has had enough of it? 
I mean, isn't Fox News doing enough exposing of woke culture? Does it even need to be exposed when Disney executives are giddy with excitement about pushing their not-at-all-secret gay agenda? They're exposing it themselves. Again, this is the same level of suspicious obviousness that The Great Reset has. It's in your face to the point of being intentionally provocative. You know, like it's drawing people out to battle, just like Joshua lured the Canaanites out into the open. When is the devil ever this upfront about what he's really up to? And one of the most powerful ways that he's luring Christians out into the open uh, with an obvious frontal attack that appeals to the immediate senses and the human you know, sense of self-righteousness and pride is through the Great Awakening's portrayal of the devil as this overtly demonic boogeyman who wants to go after children. Now, I'm not discounting that side of the devil, but he's so much smarter than just that. And that's what I find concerning with the overall conservative Christian response to the woke agenda is the implication that that's all Satan has up his sleeve, is grooming children to be gay and transsexual. You know, if we look at the story of Job and how Satan clearly did, you know, go after Job's family. He killed all of his kids. He didn't go after Job's kids just for the sake of killing his kids. He went after his kids to get Job to stumble into sin and to turn his back on God. It wasn't just for the sake of destroying he destroyed in order to get Job to fall away. He went after his kids to get Job to drop his spiritual guard. And that's what people are doing today in this you know, war on children. People will gladly let down their spiritual guard to fight against a big, scary monster that wants to you know, go after children. And they have, as is the case with Ken Ham of Answers in Genesis who's using this overtly demonic imagery in a video exposing the poisoning of children and aligning himself with Kirk Cameron. So Ken Ham is pushing this Satan's coming for your children narrative and aligning with the Great Awakening. We need to understand that that's not a coincidence. Those two things are part of the same false light mentality. Satan's coming for your kids, he's grooming your kids, and you know pushing the Great Awakening and revival. Those two things are connected. And I want to spend some time drilling home this point about this satanic boogeyman who wants to groom children and how the devil is using it as a catalyst for the false light unity and false light rebellion. This theme is widespread across the entire Great Awakening movement. From Christians to New Agers and truthers, this demonic attack against children. And it actually lines up perfectly with modern Gnosticism's portrayal of the Archons, you know, which are the demons in Gnosticism. The way the church describes Satan and demons is disturbingly similar to how New Agers and Gnostics view Satan and demons, and how they supposedly use the life force of children to gain power. It's all Gnosticism. And this is how you create a false unity having a big, scary, demonic monster that wants to pervert or harm children. Uh, Kara Dansky, the radical feminist opposed to transgenderism, you know, you heard her express her concerns with the damage that this does on young children's minds and bodies, especially with the puberty blockers and the operations. Same thing with Bill Maher. Uh, even Mickey Willis, a new ager and producer of the Plandemic films, uh, he said something about this at the Reawaken America event at John Hagee's church last year, how we're going to fight for your kids, and it got a huge applause and support from the audience. We want to send a vibrational resonance out to the planet that the children can feel all over the world, the children that might be feeling the insecurity and fear right now from everyone that they thought they could trust that is now coming after them. We make a vow right now, a pledge before God and pledge before the human organism that there is no way they will get to you, little ones. And we're going to prove that right now. And the entire pride together, one, two, three. Oh! These are the lions little ones that are rising up right now all over the world in your name because 
They have made a grave error to come after you. And there is no way that we're going to allow that. Is that right, my friends, my family, my beloved people, friends? Now, I'm aware of Mickey Willis's video from several years ago where he uh, applauded that his son chose a doll. Uh, so people might look at that and say, well, no, he's you know supporting the LGBT movement. But that doesn't alter the big picture. The awake-woke divide isn't always going to be completely clear-cut every time without exception. Uh, despite his socially liberal views, uh, he still ultimately falls on the awakened side. Uh, same case with Russell Brand. The more blatantly New Age types aren't always going to be as extreme in their opposition to LGBT as the Christian crowd is. The main point is that spiritually dangerous alliances are being formed in the name of protecting children to some degree or another. And also keep in mind that that video was from 2015, you know, seven years ago. So it's very possible that he's revised his stance since then, and, and maybe he recognizes uh, the extremes that the LGBT movement has gone to. You know, this uh, leftist opposition is only very recent. Sean Foyt has also been talking about this as well. Um, in some of the interviews that he did about the rallies at Disney, he said that protecting children is one of the most important things that God has called us to do at this time. Yeah, so this is an activist movement that's to encourage people across America to rise up and stand for biblical values and to really hold the line on all things that we're called to conserve in this season. And in this case, specifically, it's our children. I feel like it was a vision the Lord gave me about, about a, a generation of people that were standing up to hold the line when it comes to biblical values, when it comes to abortion, when it comes to, you know, protecting our children, when it comes to, the, you know, this, this crazy woke left ideology that's invading our school systems and our society right now. Jordan Peterson has also been passionately defending children against the rise of the LGBT movement and its encouragement of minors getting sex change uh, operations. He apparently wrote an article calling for the arrests of surgeons who perform these operations on minors, and it apparently got quite a bit of support. Listen to what he says here. If you look at social media, it looks like I'm faced by an overwhelming opposition, but simply not true. It's just not true. I just wrote an article for The Telegraph, which was the most devastating article I could write. I thought I was done for by writing it. I basically called for the jailing of the butchering surgeons who are uh, doing gender reassignment surgery, so-called, on minors. And I called the American Psychological Association a pack of spineless, cowardly liars. And that's pretty cut and dried, I would say. And all of the comments are positive. All of them. So all the comments were positive, as he said. I think it's very clear how the devil has given humanity a very easy villain to unite against. Because this attack on children from the woke elite has really become one of the main rallying points for the false light. And it's really given people a chance to join a self-righteous moral crusade against darkness and make them feel like they're serving God in one way or another. But keep in mind, as Christ warned, people will kill the saints thinking that they're serving God. Those who are prophesying allegiance to God will be the most passionate persecutors of the saints, just as the Apostle Paul was zealous for persecuting the church before he was saved. And yet, so much of the church is so focused on the atheist liberals. And what's interesting about this whole fight for the children cause that's become a major part of this um, anti-Disney LGBT backlash is that that's been one of the main features of the QAnon movement. This is another example of how the QAnon movement has gone mainstream. Again, going all the way back to Pizzagate in 2016 and then the WikiLeaks emails when all the pedophilia exposure started to go mainstream and uh, people started calling for mass arrests of politicians and entertainers. Like I said, that was the start of the Great Awakening, which has now basically become the official slogan for the entire conservative movement. The point is that the war against pedophilia is essentially what kickstarted the Great Awakening. 
You know, the COVID stuff is, you know, what really propelled it into the mainstream on a major level. But the pedophilia exposure through WikiLeaks was really the official beginning of it. And then in the following years after WikiLeaks, the QAnon movement started the uh, Save the Children slogan and hashtag. Um, you know, it's an organization, but they borrowed that phrase to refer to uh, saving children from the elite pedophiles. You know, I started noticing this all over social media back in 2020, uh, this Save the Children hashtag. And I would look at people's profiles who were sharing that hashtag and they were almost always caught up in the QAnon stuff or some kind of uh, political conservative cause. And in recent years, there's been this growing movement to expose pedophilia in elite circles, from Hollywood to the government. And now, through the intensification of the LGBT movement and its push on children, the fight against elite pedophilia that a few years ago was you know, only being fought by fringe conspiracy theorists is now being talked about on a mainstream level. Mainstream political commentators and popular Christian pastors and teachers all over the place are now talking about this grooming children phenomenon. For example, here's a tweet from Ali Beth Stuckey from June. Uh, she said, One consistent tactic of child sexual predators is exposing their victims to porn and conversations about sex in order to make a child more comfortable with sexual interactions. This is textbook grooming, and it's still grooming even when it's called sex ed or drag queen brunch. So the connection between pedophilia and grooming children through LGBT education, uh, like with all these drag queens reading to kids in public schools, this is all becoming common knowledge, how it's all linked with pedophilia. And as I talked about back in part one, Allie Beth Stuckey has been openly promoting the Great Awakening. Uh, she even has the, quote, resistance to tyranny is obedience to God on the wall of her podcast studio. And she also did a video recently with this thumbnail saying, the people versus the Great Reset. So she's very much caught up in the Great Awakening mentality. John MacArthur has been taking up this fight for children cause too, and has also said how the LGBT movement is leading to the normalization of pedophilia. And he's clearly been uh, pushing the Great Awakening, at least implicitly, through his rebellion to tyranny mentality and his yoking with false teachers and uh, heretical networks like TBN. Here's what he had to say on Charlie Kirk's TBN special about the transgender war on children and its connection with pedophilia. It seems as if there is a theme, which is the war on children it seems almost trying to get rid of the idea of children altogether. Uh, there are multiple professors that have come out in recent weeks uh, that have said that they don't see anything wrong between an, an adult and a child having a sexual relations. A professor from State University of New York just recently said that. You know, we were having this discussion two, three years ago. When is pedophilia going to be okay? Because if there is no authoritative moral standard, if there is no God, if there is no divine revelation, if it doesn't matter how you live uh, in, except the way you choose to live, then why would it stop at transgenderism? Why wouldn't it become pedophilia? But, but according to scripture, th this is not random sinful people doing things. This is orchestrated at a supernatural level. The frightening reality is that when the media s starts buying into these immoral trends and start twisting cartoons and Disney programs and those kinds of things that are directed at children, there's a direct purpose in going after those that are the easiest to twist, and, and that's the kids. Of all the horrific, sinful, wretched, wicked, corrupt, influences that go on in this culture. I think the thing that distresses me most is the war on children. This culture is weaponized to destroy children. Children are under a relentless assault by all the forces of evil. And they are defenseless. Children are defenseless when their parents sell them to a human trafficker who drops them eight to ten feet over a wall into 
Sodom and Gomorrah all by themselves. Or when the Disney Corporation creates characters that are transgender to seduce children into accepting wickedness as normal. Children, the most defenseless, are under attack. There is a war on children. Uh, also, Gene Bailey, the host of Flashpoint, uh, brought up this issue of this war on children during the uh, Flashpoint live event that I've been showing bits of throughout this series. And in response to Gene Bailey's point, Hank Kuhneman also brings up how this is helping to normalize pedophilia. There's been so many words from God about the children. And we've talked about the kids. This is where the nation is at now. It's like the collective veil has been lifted off our eyes and we're going, oh my gosh, what is happening to our children? What is happening to our school system that we thought was teaching uh, reading, writing, and arithmetic, and civics, and government? This is where we're at as a nation. And you know, the sad thing is they're using taxpayer money to fund pedophilia. That's what it is. So the QAnon cause of saving the children from the satanic pedophiles is now getting mainstream because of the intensification of leftist culture through the spread of the LGBT movement, which is increasingly being criticized for its predation of children. Now, all these people, Karadansky, Bill Maher, John MacArthur, Gene Bailey, Hank Kuhneman, Ali Beth Stuckey, Jordan Peterson, Mickey Willis, Sean Foyt, Charlie Kirk, Matt Walsh, Ben Shapiro, and others. Everyone across the board from radical feminist and atheist to big-name Christian pastors and teachers are taking up this fight for the children, and they are locking arms in order to do so. This has clearly been one of the main rallying points of the false light unity that's bringing together so many otherwise disparate groups, right? This big demonic tyrant that wants to prey on children, which also points to Jerusalem as the harlot that the beast destroys because the Babylonian Talmud, which is an ancient rabbinic text, condones pedophilia. Okay, this is something that the truther community has uh, jumped on long ago, and they pointed out in their attempts to expose the elites. Okay, they will often reference the Babylonian Talmud. And the fact that it's called the Babylonian Talmud is interesting because that also lines up with Jerusalem being the Babylon of Revelation. And what's also interesting is that there's even a reference to Babylon of Revelation engaging in human trafficking. Revelation 18.13 says that human souls are one of the cargo items that Babylon sells. And we hear more and more today about the issue of human trafficking, especially that of children. Again, this is something that the New Age and truther communities have been very passionate about unveiling to the world so that we can defeat the evil agenda, the evil satanic agenda, overthrow it, and build a paradise. So this growing sexual perversion with LGBT, pedophilia, uh, the stuff in Hollywood, which you know is often said to be run by the Jews, this is all the result of the harlot. And the rest of the world will eventually rise up and fight back against this stuff via the beast system. And that's why I'm so concerned with so many Christian ministries and channels getting caught up in this satanic exposure whether it's Disney or Hollywood or the music industry or whatever. Because I don't think they realize that what they're actually exposing and what they're actually contributing to. They're essentially kind of feeding the beast, so to speak. And the unfortunate reality is that this kind of stuff brings in views and money. It's popular. This is what people want to hear right now. They want to hear about satanic exposure. But this is in direct violation. Again, this is why I keep bringing this verse up in 1 Corinthians 5.12, where Paul says that we have no business judging the world. But this is exactly what Christians are caught up in doing. This is what draws you into the false light, is the false presumption that you have the right to judge the world. 
And this year in particular, there's been this growing concern over the LGBT movement's grooming of children. Okay, this has been uh, widespread among the conservative criticism of Disney and the LGBT movement. I'm seeing this more and more now. For example, Matt Walsh has made a lot of videos where he uses the verbiage of grooming in reference to LGBT advocates. Journalist Tim Poole has also used this language uh, against the LGBT movement. Uh, here's a tweet from him uh, sharing a tweet from Andy No, uh, where he's showing footage from a drag show for children that was held in Dallas. And Poole's tweet about it says, quote, yes, they are grooming your kids. Also, here's a post from a new ager that I follow. Uh, he's as new age as it gets. And he says this, heads up, it is actually that they are trying to slowly take rights away from the parents so children can become the state's property. They know if they can get away with this, they can get away with anything. And then he shared this tweet from Joel Berry, who is the managing editor of the Babylon Bee, which has you know, gone completely off the rails recently, uh, assuming that they were ever on the rails to begin with. And this is what Joel Berry said in this tweet from August 25th. Quote, if they think toddlers can consent to gender counseling, 14-year-olds can consent to hormones, and 16-year-olds can consent to trans surgery, then they also think that they can consent to sex. They just haven't openly admitted it yet. Gender ideology is a pedophile movement. So this is significant. This is a new ager publicly uniting with a conservative Christian media outlet in agreement that gender ideology is ultimately intended to normalize pedophilia and take away people's rights. Again, this is a picture of the beast's unity against the harlot. And also, here's a woman on TikTok. Uh, she's a lesbian, and she recently put out a video uh, that's gone pretty viral, and it's been shared by uh, conservatives. Listen to what she says. This is incredibly telling, easily one of the most telling clips of this entire video. If I would have understood when I was younger that fighting for my rights as a lesbian would mean allowing children to drag shows, attaching child molesters to our community, and allowing children to change their sex before they even know what their favorite color is. I would have never done it. Never. So this link between the LGBT movement and the normalization of pedophilia is a widely acknowledged phenomenon, even by homosexuals themselves. This lesbian is distraught over what the LGBT movement has led to. You know, you can hear she's on the verge of tears. And she even feels partly responsible, like she's contributed to this, you know, by fighting for her rights as a lesbian. So this is hardly something that only the church or only the right recognizes and has an issue with. Even secular hardcore leftists are now recognizing not just the negative effects on children, but the way the LGBT movement has become a gateway for pedophiles to get closer to children. This is how far the QAnon mentality has reached, to where it's now even waking up lesbians. Steven Crowder, uh, one of the most popular conservative commentators out there today, uh, he's the one who does the Change My Mind videos. Uh, he's been talking about the normalization of pedophilia via the LGBT movement uh, for several years now. I remember he was the first mainstream conservative commentator that I saw uh, that was talking about the creepy pedophile tendencies of big name uh, Democrats. And this is a clip from him all the way back in 2019. Another question of the day. Do you think that the whole push for pedophilia now has become mainstream? At what point does it become mainstream? Yeah. And uh, how far, I, you know, it's, we're not just going down a slippery, it's not a slippery slope. It's like we're going down a slope in a flying saucer with the cereal varnish from Christmas <laughs> vacation. <laughs> yes. It is yeah. remarkable. Yeah. Nice. It's yeah, crazy. Yes, uh, yesterday. Yesterday. Gosh, it seems like it was a week ago. Mario yeah. Lopez, he was attacked because he had the gall. He had the stones, mind you, to say that parents should be careful about three-year-olds choosing their gender. Right? He was forced to apologize. Yeah. That's insane. 
Absolutely insane. So think about that for a second before we move on to the, how this relates to sort of pe pedophilia and this hypersexualization of yeah. children and how it's become mainstream. Think of what that apology signifies. Okay, he is saying, I am sorry for suggesting that parents <laughs> yeah. wow. shouldn't allow their three-year-old or four-year-old or eight-year-old child to make a permanent decision regarding puberty blockers and stunting their growth for the rest of their life. I am so sorry, I now know better, and I will be more thoughtful in the future. It, by that I mean guaranteeing uh, the moral high ground to the opinion that all children should make permanent sexual decisions at the age of three. And that's why I have, I have no tolerance for people who apologize on these issues anymore. All right, so let's go to the oh, second point terrible. here. Normalizing Pedophilia, this is happening right. We normalize it yeah. outright right now. Uh, didn't die out in yeah. the 70s. No. Just, I think we have some overlays here. The pedophilia supporting mm -hmm. publications, they've been running stories over the last yeah. few years. Yep. Yeah, we actually broke the fact that the salon pedophile was the one who was actually still yeah. currently grooming children. And yep. then they wrote an article that we were monsters. Yep. <laughs> Here's something else that's been going on for a long time. Child drag queens, yeah. okay? Oh, yeah. uh, I think we have some B-roll, 11 year old drag queen, Desmond. Uh, this is, yeah, called Desmond is Amazing. Stripping at a club, having money thrown at him for people who can't oh, see right gosh. now. Look at this. Tell me that isn't disturbing. Yeah. Look at this. This is a boy stripping, and they say there's nothing sexual about like this. Stripping and men giving him money. By the way, I got in trouble at 14 for mowing lawns because it was a violation <laughs> of the Labor Bureau. Mm -hmm. Remember that? They were like, "You technically you're not supposed yeah. to do that. It's illegal." What about when they're making it rain on an 11 year old <laughs> exactly. dressed in Michael yeah. Jackson sailor yeah. pants? And what's especially interesting about Crowder is that not only was he among the first big political commentators to talk about the uh, child grooming tendencies of the left, but he was also a major confirmation for me about what I had suspected was coming, uh, which was the overall mainstreaming of conspiracy theory, because he started collaborating with Alex Jones all the way back in 2016, and he's continued collaborating with him ever since. And so uh, I saw the partnership between Crowder and Jones as another confirmation that the truth or narrative really was going mainstream, like I thought. Uh, Steven Crowder has definitely been one of the main bridges between trutherism and mainstream conservatism. And speaking of Alex Jones and Infowars, a Disney employee, I mistakenly referred to him earlier as a former Disney executive, I meant to say a current Disney employee, named Nick Caterano. Uh, he's been making the rounds recently, doing a lot of interviews with conservative media outlets, He's one of these whistleblowers that are always talked about in truther circles. Uh, whistleblowers, you know, who come out exposing the agenda from the inside. And one of the interviews that he did was with a woman named Christy Lay. Uh, she has her own media outlet, but she's in collaboration with Alex Jones's site, Band.video. And as you can see, they also posted about it on Infowars. Uh, this is the interview that I referenced earlier in the video that I said would be coming back to. And Christy Lay herself is very much caught up in the Great Awakening, Save America, Fight for Freedom movement, as you can see here on one of her social media posts. And she did an interview with Caterano titled, Disney Cast Member Tell All, Why Disney is Grooming Kids. Okay, so there again is the reference to child grooming, uh, which ties in with the QAnon movement's desire to fight and expose pedophilia. Uh, which they mention in this interview as well, as we'll get into. And as expected, this interview contained many of the common hallmarks of the Great Awakening mentality. It was about an hour and 15 minute long interview, and I've clipped some of the highlights for you guys to listen to. And I really want you guys to pay close attention to everything that he says, because every little bit that I clipped from the interview uh, was done so for a reason, because the things that they say are a perfect illustration of the false light great awakening mentality that is everywhere right now. And we really have to be careful to guard ourselves against this kind of thinking and this kind of rhetoric. Okay, so here's the first little segment of highlights. So I've had I've had a really good go at it, um, fortunately, where I'm at, besides the discrimination and the mask, I don't even know where you stand on those issues. Um, but that's how I got into all this fight. I was fighting against the mandates, uh, now fighting against discrimination, and that, and that turned into a, a bit of a national movement. Um, and, and then now the wokeness, uh, which has been kind of a, a slow burn, which has now uh, reached uh, national and world attention. You know, I think of George Orwell, 1984, and you're see, you know, the truth ministry that they're, 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 they're lifting up. Um, you know, I, I love that quote by George Orwell. Um, 
uh, you know, in, in times of universal deceit, speaking the truth is a, uh, will be a re considered a, re a revolutionary act. So first he mentioned how he got involved in this current fight against Disney and the LGBT movement because he had already been involved in fighting against the virus mandates, uh, the masks and the jab and so forth. He talks more extensively in the interview about how, at first, he was the only one uh, taking a stand against the masks and the jab and how slowly over time more and more people joined him. Uh, so he's telling us point blank that fighting against Disney and wokeness is a continuation of the same movement that was fighting against all the COVID stuff. Okay, it's all part of the same false light culture war. And as I showed back in part one, General Mike Flynn, in his interview with uh, Stephen Strang, he said that the COVID stuff was one of the original impetuses for the Reawaken America tour. So this fight against Disney and LGBT is another part of this growing rebellion. He also mentioned uh, George Orwell in his book in 1984, uh, which is another hallmark of the false light mentality. Uh, this is something else I've been pointing out how the so-called Orwellian nightmare of 1984 is the New Age, truther, false light, great awakening view of the beast system. In other words, believing that Orwell's 1984 is an accurate depiction of the beast system is another characteristic of this great deception. Okay, you'll often hear New Agers and truthers, uh, Alex Jones being chief among them, always point to 1984 and say how it's all coming true and that it's a fulfillment of Revelation 13. A good example of this is J.P. Sears, who has a very popular YouTube channel called Awaken with J.P. Uh, he's very into the New Age. He was doing a lot of New Age-themed comedy and satire videos before he started getting into the political and patriotic stuff, which is what he's been doing more of lately in the past couple years. He's done tons of videos exposing the Great Reset. Uh, he's basically just a more politically conservative Russell Brand. And he did a video recently called Make 1984 Fiction Again. And as you can see in the thumbnail, he's also using this obvious demonic imagery to portray Klaus Schwab and the Great Reset. So once again, pushing the obvious satanic boogeyman narrative that's part of the Great Awakening false light mentality. That's a hallmark of the Great Awakening deception that's eventually going to lead the world to go to war with the beast against the demonic harlot. And anyway, here's a little clip from that video just to further drive home the point about how the Great Awakening mentality is fixated on how 1984 is coming true. Have you noticed how 1984 is playing out in real life? <laughs> it's a horror film. Now at the end of this video, I'll share with you my perspective on what you can do to help make 1984 fiction again because it makes a much better story than it does a reality. But in order to do that, it's helpful to recognize how 1984 is playing out in our world today. It's been said that you can't get out of a jail you don't know you're in. But once you know you're in a jail, you can recognize it, and then you can do something to get out of it. And in this case, it's more like, you can't get out of Orwell's 1984 horror film until you know you're in it. So let's take a look at how we're in it so we can get out of it. Why do conspiracy theories prove to be more true than reality oftentimes? Conspiracy theorists keep getting things right. Experts say that's dangerous. Dangerous to get things right? Thank you, Thought Police. I'll go back to sleep now. With that said, I think if we all do our part in taking back control of our minds, we can collectively make 1984 fiction again because a film is much better to watch than to live. Stay free, my friend. So we all have to realize that we're living in the Orwellian nightmare so that we can wake up from that nightmare. Okay, that's the essence of the false awakening. And that's what the devil has been implementing. First, the darkness to push humanity toward the false light. We have to take control of our minds, take control of our autonomy, our freedoms, our rights, our independence, and rise up together and stop this Orwellian nightmare from becoming a full-blown reality. Okay, that's what this Great Awakening deception is all about, and that's what the Beast Revolution is going to be about. It's going to be about stopping the Orwellian nightmare.
It's all about humanity collectively waking up from the Orwellian nightmare. 1984 is not a fictional portrayal of the beast. It's a fictional portrayal of the harlot and the Jewish control system. And there are some clues in the novel that this is actually the case. Now, I'm going to read something from the draft of my book, The False Apocalypse, uh, which is stuck in creative limbo for the time being. Uh, but this is from much later in the book. This was not part of the free preview that I put out a few years ago. Uh, that was only the first few chapters. But what I'm going to read for you guys here is from chapter 6, called The Gnostic War Against Satanism, uh, which ties in perfectly with everything that I've been talking about in this video. Here's what it says, quote, Not surprisingly, George Orwell has directly contributed to building up the Jewish identity of the New World Order. As we talked about at the beginning of the first chapter, the character Emmanuel Goldstein, a name so Jewish that it comes off as satire, was a fake disinformation agent created by the party to control opposition. And just in case his on-the-nose, no pun intended, Jewish name wasn't enough, Orwell carefully describes Goldstein's Jewish appearance, which, in Hitler-esque fashion, seems to possess devilish qualities. And this is Orwell's description of, of Goldstein. It was a lean Jewish face with a great fuzzy aureole of white hair and a small goatee beard. Satanic reference? A clever face, and yet somehow inherently despicable, with a kind of senile silliness in the long, thin nose, near the end of which a pair of spectacles was perched. It resembled the face of a sheep. Listen to that. The face of a sheep. And the voice, too, had a sheep-like quality. So it's very interesting how descriptive Orwell was about Goldstein's face. Like I said, it's very Hitler-esque in its description especially his remark about it being inherently despicable, right? As if that had something to do with him being Jewish. And what's especially interesting is how he said that Goldstein had the face of a sheep. Because as many of you know, this false light rebellion specifically targets the idea of being a sheep. For example, QAnon with its uh, Sheep No More slogan. Also, the name of that website that I showed back in part one uh, talking about the meditation movement against Pizzagate. It was also called Sheep No More, and that came before QAnon. Uh, there's also this Lions Not Sheep slogan within the NAR movement. Uh, for example, uh, here's Derek Gates wearing a shirt that says Lions Not Sheep. Uh, I talked about him in part two of my Jehu series. Uh, he was part of this uh, revival event called The Rise of the Jehus. And David Icke, a Gnostic and one of the leaders of this New World Order uh, rebellion, this Great Awakening, he's the one who coined the term sheeple that truthers often use to refer to people who aren't awake. Um, in fact, J.P. Sears also used the term sheep in a derogatory way in another part of the video that I showed from before. Uh, here's a clip of that. Trust yourself. And when you find yourself not going along with the herd, take that as a sign that you're probably not being a sheep with that said so this idea of using sheep in a derogatory way goes all the way back to orwell's 1984 with his description of goldstein this jewish character this very nefarious jewish character as having sheep-like characteristics in fact a lot of the hallmarks of the truther narrative come from orwell's novel Okay, controlled opposition is another example, which the Goldstein character represents. It's unfortunate how many people use the term controlled opposition. Okay, it's another truther concept. So people who use that term haven't fully come out of the truther mentality, even if they believe there's, you know, they're somewhat keyed in on the deception of the Great Awakening. Okay, many people will just say that the Great Awakening is controlled opposition, and I'm just like, no, you're missing the point. <laughs> Uh, you know, you're still stuck in the awakening mentality when you're saying that. It's typically the same people who will refer to the Great Awakening or QAnon as a PSYOP that's being carried out by the elites. Okay, it's just another form of conspiracy theory. The Great Awakening deception is rooted in the truther mentality. And so if you're calling the Great Awakening controlled opposition or a PSYOP, you're actually still stuck in the Great Awakening mentality because, again, you're pointing the finger at some elitist agenda because the elites are supposedly the ones you know, behind the controlled opposition or the PSYOP. 
Again, the Great Awakening deception is about waking up to the agenda of the elites. And so if you're calling the Great Awakening a PSYOP or controlled opposition, you're actually just showing that you're still kind of stuck in the Great Awakening mentality. And so this trend of using sheep as a derogatory term, as a term used to describe the elites and or those controlled by the elites, you know, the ones who are still asleep, it's actually a Gnostic slander against the biblical identity of the Lord as the great shepherd and his followers as sheep. Again, this is why it all goes back to Gnosticism. And it ultimately goes back to the ancient Gnostics view of the God of the Bible as an evil tyrant who just wants to control humanity for his own pleasure. And remember, as I've pointed out before, the saints will be lumped in with the demonic harlot because we'll be seen as going along with or supporting the tyranny because we won't take the mark of the beast and fight for the freedom of the planet. And interestingly, the saints will be slaughtered as sheep by the beast, which interestingly lines up perfectly with Psalm 44:22 which says, yet for your sake, we are killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Okay, which Paul quotes in Romans 8.36, which is interesting because in verse 37, he goes on to say that we are more than conquerors through Christ, which again lines up with the saints in Revelation who, uh, though many of them will be killed as sheep, they will conquer the beast spiritually by the blood of the Lamb. So it's really interesting how all that connects. But we will be regarded as sheep to be slaughtered by the beast system and those who support it. So anyway, just be aware of this correlation between Revelation 13 and 1984. It's very prevalent within the Christian wing of the false light as well. Uh, for example, Pastor Alan DiDio, who I've talked about before, uh, he's one of these false charismatic preachers pushing the Great Awakening. Um, here he is talking about Orwell's 1984 in a sermon from a few years ago. The novel was titled 1984. It was written only months before George Orwell's death. And it is a story of a negative utopia gripped by totalitarianism. After the bloody events of a world war, society decided with the help of the people as accomplices with the government that we didn't want violence anymore and the way we would conquer it is through control. Control of the human body, control of the human soul, even control of the human spirit. He lays out a stunning picture of a society so full of fear and under complete subjection he lays it out so clearly that some have rightly questioned whether 1984 is a novel or a prophecy. With stunning detail, he describes a government that is so invasive, it seems to be able to police thought. Ominous signs hang everywhere that declare, Big Brother is watching you with an all-seeing eye that seems to follow you wherever you go. He was what he was predicting was the complete subjugation of the human personality. And my dear brother and sister, if it were not for the grace and mercy of God, we would be there already today. We have been teetering and tottering on the edge of this type of totalitarian system for a long, long time. And Orwell's dystopian prophecy would already be a reality if it weren't for the revivals of the 20th century after the Second World War, the revival of the charismatic renewal, the revival of the prosperity movement, the revival of the word of faith renewal, the revival of the healing movement. If it weren't for those moves of God, the hand of the spirit of Antichrist would already be laid on more of our society than we see it being laid today. But tonight, as we stand on the edge of 2018, we have come to another tipping point. So DiDio, just like many other false teachers and truthers and New Agers, uh, the whole Great Awakening movement, he sees 1984 as an accurate even prophetic novel that portrays what we see in Revelation 13. And that is one of the hallmarks of this great deception. To believe that 1984 is prophetically tied with the beast of Revelation 13, and this idea that the beast is a totalitarian regime similar to the one depicted in Orwell's 1984. 
the Dio himself explicitly made this connection when he tied 1984 with the spirit of Antichrist. And to be clear, he's not talking about the spirit of Antichrist in the general sense. He's talking about the Antichrist or the beast of Revelation 13. And ironically, he says that these so-called moves of God, these revivals, have held back the spirit of Antichrist. He is completely deluded. He thinks the devil is only working through totalitarianism, completely oblivious to the fact that these charismatic revivals and dominionist movements that he speaks so highly of are actually much more representative of what the Bible says the beast and false prophet will bring on the earth. Okay, 2 Thessalonians 2.9 says that the coming of the lawless one is by Satan with all power and false signs and wonders. And then Christ says in Matthew 24 that false Christs and false prophets will arise to perform signs and wonders to deceive even the elect. And Revelation 13 says that the false prophet will be calling down fire from heaven, mimicking Elijah. And as far as I know, no totalitarian dictator has ever talked about signs and wonders. Okay, that's Alan DiDio's camp. That's the Great Awakening side. Okay, it's Alan DiDio and his spiritual kin who are the ones who go on and on about signs and wonders and a coming Elijah revolution. So I think it's pretty clear for those with eyes to see who's really projecting the spirit of the Antichrist. Going back to the Great Awakening versus Great Reset dichotomy, signs and wonders are features of the Great Awakening, not the Great Reset. It's these false apostolic moves of God that push against totalitarianism that are actually pictures of the coming of the lawless one. Okay, the forces of totalitarianism are what Alice Bailey, the mother of the New Age movement, was fighting against. And these revivals and awakenings that DiDio says have held back the move of totalitarianism, that's a picture of the tension between the beast and the harlot. The rise of the beast and false prophet will be the final great awakening or so-called move of God that will push back against the more overtly satanic and demonic totalitarian agenda of the harlot. Again, remember the overtly demonic imagery that's always applied to the Great Reset side of things. And how Revelation 18.2 says that Babylon the harlot is a dwelling place for demons. And so what DiDio is doing by warning people about the so-called prophetic nature of 1984 is a picture of the beast and false prophet galvanizing the earth dwellers against the harlot of Babylon. Because what George Orwell was depicting in his novel was the agenda of the harlot, not the beast. And that's what's being exposed to the world right now and what the world is gradually rising up against. It's all building toward the final destruction of the harlot by the beast, which is what I think will trigger the cries of peace and safety from 1 Thessalonians 5.3, which will then be abruptly cut short by the sudden destruction of Christ's vengeful return on the clouds. So anyway, since Nick Caterano quoted Orwell, I wanted to take the opportunity to explain the deception behind the references to Orwell in 1984 and how it's a red flag for the Great Awakening deception. Uh, but now we'll go ahead and get back to the rest of the highlights of Caterano's interview. Uh, there's still quite a lot to go through. This next segment is about seven minutes, and I've done my best to organize the clips topically so that everything is easy to follow. Uh, but the basic outline is how what's been going on with Disney and the pushing of LGBT is being linked by more and more people with the grooming of children and the normalization of pedophilia and how the devil is using this attack on children to further blind people spiritually and push the great awakening deception further you know i'll give you a perfect example here in orlando a good friend of mine uh, told me a story right before covid the, sh the shutdowns uh, she went to her eight-year-old's family night and was talking to the teachers just you know like all the parents do it was a it was a magnet school um and then the teacher pulled her aside and said you know we've actually been helping your son for the last six months uh get comfortable with his gayness and she's like my son's eight years old what are you talking about well he hasn't really felt comfortable around girls we notice he really likes boys more he's involved in a love triangle and, and my friend was just freaked out like my kid's eight years old what are you talking about and they took it upon themselves to, to for eight for six months they were kind of grooming this kid and this kid was not even telling his mom about it 
and and imagine his horror that he's you know they're catching him off guard putting planting those seeds in his head and and you know two years later he's girl crazy um and she's had to take him out of that environment but but yeah these things were all going on and and for disney not to be the adult in the room and 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 take a stand and say hey this is not what this is we believe in, in protecting children and you know they could have even taken the stand when children are old enough to understand things and 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 you know that's another story but right now we're, we're talking about pre-k to third grade um and in my opinion it should be a lot longer than that uh but but i think that would be the adult thing to do and they would have weathered it and and people would have respected them in the long run but I, I, again, I don't, I don't think it was, you know, many people said they were pressured into it. Um, but when we have the leaked video, which I think they, they put out there of all these leaders within Disney talking about these things and all these big changes were being made, no more boys and girls, you know, dreamers of all ages and, and people proud of all the things they've been leaking in. And they were surprised that they were allowed to get away with it. I think, you know, we see that, that this is, what they wanted they wanted to have this culture war so they they were okay with it so um npr politico they don't like that this word grooming has been applied to these teachers that are trying to have these sexual conversations with third graders and younger um so they're coming out with they're trying to uh make this delineation between um no this over here acceptance and of 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 people different in, in education. This is different than over here, uh, pedophilia. Um, but the problem with that is that's not what the evidence is showing. Um, many people saw the gay men's choir and the song, we're coming for your children, we're coming for your children. And, oh, wow, that seems a bit uncomfortable. Um, and, uh, oh, no, that's not what we meant. And then when they looked further, many of those people were on sex offender lists, or, oh my gosh, pedophilia. And then you had the um, Drag Queen Story Hour here in Austin, uh, where I'm based. And, um, oh no, this is just, just for fun. It's just to teach the kids, whatever. It's no big deal. And then, oh, again, a shocker. Uh, those men that wanted to scantily dress and read to kids and be around them and hug them. Oh, yeah, they, some of them were on the sex offender list too. So we've seen Disney has had arrests those working within the company have been arrested for um, sexual offenses. Uh, even recently, I believe there was four of them just recently. Um, and then you hear these rumors about it going even deeper with, you know, there's trafficking going on. Why do you need a man in his underwear, a picture of a man in his underwear with a bulge to talk to young kids about not being a bully or, or accepting people for their differences. You don't. It's sick. You don't do it. And um, this is, has been so upsetting because it's just the people that only watch mainstream news don't realize where we're coming from. I've seen what they're trying to put in front of the kids' faces. It has nothing to do about with uh, acceptance, has nothing to do with not being a bully, and it has everything to do with your shoving pornographic images and forcing kids to have conversations about attraction when they're not even old enough to comprehend it. You know, it's, a, it's an assault on the world. It's an assault on our country, especially because they got to bring us down before they can steamroll through and, and, and galvanize the rest of the world. Um, but I see all these things as just tools in the Marxist toolbox is how I've termed it. And, you know, we're under assault with medical freedom. We're under assault on, on culture. Um, you know, this, this, this trying to trans kids uh, at an early age and to, and to attack the family because any reasonable person looked at it with common sense and knew how harmful and damaging all this was. We didn't need data to figure that out. We're just human beings with common sense. And, and understanding and, and compassionate and empathy towards young people. Um, I, 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 again, I just feel it's just another tool in the Marxist toolbox to, to grind at this country down and to keep attacking us from all ends until people just give up. And I think that's the goal is to get people to give up, which is, which is just making a lot of us dig in. Um, we're not, we're not going to give up, you know, as a person of faith, I find that man without God, seeks to think he is God. Um, and, and, and you see it with these elites, right? They've accomplished so much. They want to control the world. They want to determine how they're going to do it and, and what everybody should have, what rights they should or shouldn't have and what they should be doing. And the people at the top 
that know better are allowing this to happen and pushing it to happen because it makes them have control a lot easier because who can fight back when you're tearing up the family, when everybody's fighting to survive, everybody's fighting each other and, you know, and, and, and people in, in that are, that their big mission is, is doing these things and, and grooming kids. Well, they're not really going to be fighting or doing anything that's really important or contributing anything real is important. So they're pretty easy to control. And I think you see that with the whole toxic masculinity thing that we saw that big push, you know, toxic men, they, they call it toxic masculinity, but who's going to be doing all these hard jobs? I mean, who's going to, you know, it's just, it's just such insanity to see the, the absurdity of the, of the, the kind of things that they try to push forward. It, it's really disturbing when you look down the rabbit hole and how many things are true. Um, we know, we know that there's that documentary I saw out of shadows about the pedophilia in Hollywood. That was really solid stuff. And when you looked into it and you realize, wow, look through it already and just realize we're in a spiritual war and they're out to, t and they're out to destroy the country, the family and, and globally. Okay. So a few things to unpack here. Uh, first of all, you heard multiple references to this grooming of children in the schools at Disney, et cetera, through this spread of the LGBT movement and how, uh, there's some very bizarre stuff that's been happening. And then they went on to talk about the connection with pedophilia and how some of these drag queens reading to kids had been on sex offender lists. And apparently similar things have been found out with some Disney employees. So again, this is a continuation on a larger scale of the QAnon movement to save the children from child predators. Okay, It's all part of the same momentum. Then you heard Caterano make the connection between the LGBT stuff and the larger culture war. Okay, He explicitly referenced the culture war, uh, which is something that's being acknowledged across the board right now. Okay, Bill Maher referenced it earlier, so did Ben Shapiro. And you're going to hear other people reference it throughout the rest of this series too. And he also said how the LGBT agenda is part of the larger Marxist agenda. Okay, One of the tools in the Marxist toolbox. Again, this is one of the main enemies of the false light movement. Communism, Marxism, okay, just like it was with Hitler. Secularism, paganism, Satanism, communism. These are always the opponents of the dominionist and new age movements. So there's a lot of false light culture war rhetoric that's being discussed in this interview. Child grooming, pedophilia, communism, Marxism, globalism, culture war. Okay, he also mentioned medical tyranny. Okay, this is the kind of rhetoric that is becoming very, very commonplace because these are all aspects of the dark side, the so-called satanic Jezebel Baal side that the false light is rising up against. And something else that's interesting is the fact that Karl Marx was a Jew. And the fact that Karl Marx was a Jew further supports the idea that the Great Awakening versus the Great Reset is a picture of the beast's war against the harlot and that the Great Awakening is really about waking up to the Jewish harlot system. And Marx absolutely wanted to destroy the family. In uh, one of his works, uh, The German Ideology, he wrote, quote, the earthly family must be destroyed. Okay, that's a direct quote. So that's definitely part of the communist assault. And that's why transgenderism is being pushed so much too, uh, to further weaken and destroy the family. So I'm not denying that any of this is going on. Okay, I think this is part of the Jewish harlot agenda to subdue and control the Gentile world, which the beast will eventually rise up to galvanize the world against the harlot. The harlot is the godless elites who want to control the world, as Caterano described them. And we're seeing this coming rebellion against the so-called godless elites pick up more and more momentum. Okay, for example, here's a very interesting headline from Sky News Australia that says, Uprising against the elites goes global. And this global rebellion against the elites is exactly what I've been warning about and saying was coming for the past six years, that the New World Order agenda would be exposed, conspiracy theory would go mainstream, and there would be this global rebellion against it, and that that rebellion would be the actual precursor to the beast system. Caterano also mentioned this culture war against the dark leftist communist agenda and described it as a spiritual war, which is something that we're hearing a lot of right now. 
And that's another big part of this deception is making people believe that joining this fight is to fight against the satanic powers that are trying to take over the world. But as Caterano himself said, what he's fighting against only requires common sense, right? He said, any reasonable person can look at this stuff with common sense and basic compassion and empathy for children and recognize that this stuff is harmful. So that's one of the biggest issues with calling this a spiritual war. The fact that basic common sense can detect it. You know, we've already seen how atheist liberals and radical feminists think that this stuff has gone too far. And I don't know if you noticed, but it really stuck out to me how much emotion was in Christy Lay's voice as she was talking about this sexualized stuff that's being pushed on kids. It's sick. You don't do it. And um, this is, has been so upsetting because it's just the people that only watch mainstream news don't realize where we're coming from. I've seen what they're trying to put in front of the kids' faces. It has nothing to do about with uh, acceptance, has nothing to do with not being a bully, and it has everything to do with your shoving pornographic images and forcing kids to have conversations about attraction when they're not even old enough to comprehend it. Emotion is blinding, and the devil is using this stirred up emotion from this war against children to his advantage. He's appealing to the flesh, people's emotions, their love for their country, their morality, their freedom, their self-righteousness, all the monuments that they've built to themselves, just like King Saul built a monument to himself. And Satan is attacking these monuments to draw people into a counterfeit spiritual war to defend these monuments. Just like he attacked Job, Satan is attacking all of these things, our precious culture and the children to stir up people into a war of the flesh and keep them locked in spiritual delusion. And it's all rooted in fear. I went into this in depth in my video, When We Walk in Fear. People are not fighting out of faith. They're fighting out of fear. The fear of the loss of losing their freedoms. They're acting like scared animals. King Saul fell deeper and deeper into spiritual delusion because of fear. Fear drove Saul to the point where he sought spiritual advice from a medium, a witch. And that's basically what a lot of Christians are doing today, is they're seeking advice from an occult form of Christianity. There's a woman who follows my channel uh, who commented recently about this. Uh, she used to be heavily into trutherism, and she confirmed from her own experience how powerfully these attacks on freedom and our families and the children kept her locked in a fleshly mentality and made her believe that she was fighting a spiritual war when really she was stuck in the flesh. This is what she said, quote, When I was still a truther and caught up in the false light, it was wanting to protect my kids at all costs that kept me locked into the flesh and fighting for this earthly kingdom. Right, And that's what the post-millennialists are fighting for too, this earthly kingdom. Fear of what the loss of freedom might mean for them kept me awake at night. Okay, there's the fear. I also remember the very day I woke up to the spiritual war against our children, and she's talking about the false awakening. Not saying that there isn't an agenda against the younger generation, but it is such a powerful motivator to get people to fight for the flesh with their flesh. And that's absolutely correct. There definitely is an agenda against children, just as Satan really did kill Job's kids. But the spiritual war is not, you know, protecting the children from physical attack. If that's what spiritual war is, then clearly Job lost, right? But no, the spiritual war for Job was in how he responded to the attack on his children, keeping his faith, keeping his sights on God, praising God no matter what. You need much more than common sense to recognize true spiritual deception and win the true spiritual battle. So if common sense can recognize it, then it's not spiritual deception, at least not the kind that Christ warned about in Matthew 24, deception that would deceive even the elect if possible. That kind of deception is coming from the great awakening side, not the great reset side. That kind of deception is coming from the side that's fighting against wokeness and LGBT and pedophilia and abortion and communism and the great reset. Keep in mind, by false light standards, Jehu won the spiritual war. 
because he destroyed Jezebel and the cult of Baal. Jehu took down the satanic cult, which is what the Great Awakening wants to do as well. And the beast will be victorious in a similar way. The beast will win the culture war too. The beast destroying the harlot will be the final culture war. But the saints will lose the culture war. They will be worn out by the beast. They will be conquered in the flesh. But they will be spiritually victorious against the beast, as it says in Revelation 12, 11, by holding fast to their faith, just like Job did, right? by the word of their testimony and by not loving their lives even unto death. The saints will be victorious in the spirit by giving up hope in the transient fleshly victory that the Great Awakening is promising. But the devil is attacking people's lives, not because he wants to destroy life and liberty, but because he wants to cause people to stumble into sin and Gnosticism and fight for this world and lead them into spiritual death. This is his world, and he wants people to fight for it. And so the unfortunate fact is that with people getting more and more blinded by their emotions and their love for their country and their freedoms, they are being set up for a very serious fall into sin and a Gnostic rebellion that's being disguised as a righteous war against evil. This is not a spiritual war. And anyone calling this a spiritual war is at great risk of falling for the strong delusion of the Antichrist. And I would be very wary of any ministries or channels or teachers or pastors who similarly call this a spiritual war. What's really happening is that mankind is gradually getting more and more fed up with this Jewish Zionist attempt to control them. That's what the world is waking up to right now. That's what the rabbit hole essentially is. You know, you heard Caterano mention the rabbit hole too, which is another truth or term that's part of the Great Awakening mentality. To go down the rabbit hole is basically to learn about the Zionist Jewish elite plan to control the world. And that's why it's the real Gnostic trap and leads people into Gnosticism. Because what it's ultimately preparing people to do is eventually rise up in Gnostic rebellion along with the beast in his war against Jerusalem, the harlot. And for anyone who's familiar with the history of Gnosticism, ancient Gnosticism was rooted in a hatred of Old Testament Judaism and its God. This is why so many people tied with the Great Awakening and exposing the New World Order will often promote Gnostic texts. In fact, Yuval Noah Harari, who is the top advisor to Klaus Schwab, uh, the main figurehead of the Great Reset, is a Jew. Uh, George Soros, who's also a higher up on the Great Reset side, is also a Jew. So this growing movement of exposing Hollywood, run by the Jews, exposing communism, started by a Jew, exposing pedophilia, promoted in ancient Jewish rabbinical texts, exposing the Great Reset, which includes high-ranking Jews. It's exposing the harlot system, and it's building up toward the eventual destruction of the harlot by the beast. Even the QAnon movement, in some of Q's drops, he talked about the Rothschild family, um, a Jewish family, and how they're the leader of the global satanic cult that's behind this tyrannical agenda. Here's a shot of one of Q's drops. It says, Rothschilds are the cult leaders of the New World Order and worship Satan. So there again is the reference to Satanism. They have worldwide control over banks, financial institutions, and governments. These people are sick and evil. And then you can see George Soros is mentioned there as well. So this is what the Great Awakening is really about. Waking up to the satanic controlling agenda of the Jewish harlot system. And so with this increasing exposure of all this overtly satanic stuff, pedophilia, child sacrifice, communism, tyranny, Satanism, etc., the world is being primed for the arrival of the beast as a counterfeit Christ to take down this satanic, demonic system of the harlot. Remember, the harlot is a dwelling place for demons. So it's going to be a counterfeit Christ taking down a counterfeit beast. And so this pushback against the LGBT agenda and Disney and the idea that it's part of this child grooming agenda to normalize pedophilia, this is all part of the larger false light war. 
if you remember, the, the pedophile networks were one of the big things that the QAnon movement has uh, become known for speaking out against. Right? They want to take down the satanic blood-drinking pedophiles. It's really the satanic panic of the 80s on steroids. And now more and more the Christian right is taking up this fight as well because of this idea that the LGBT movement is targeting children, causing them mental illness and trauma, and normalizing pedophilia. Right, They're going after children and want to groom them with their hypersexualized content and education. Like I said, it's the satanic panic of the 80s on steroids. It's a large-scale awakening and pushback against the demonic harlot agenda. The implementation of Babylonian Talmudic principles and communism, which is all Jewish. And that's why we're seeing more and more exposure of Satanism and pedophilia, which is the same stuff that QAnon and the New Age movement have also been very interested in exposing and stopping. Not just in a conceptual way or in a theoretical way, but in a very real and tangible way. I showed this back in my Road to Antichrist series. These are a couple of articles from a website called ExoPolitics. It's a New Age truther website run by a man named Michael Sala, uh, who's written many New Age conspiracy books about ETs and the Galactic Federation, uh, which you know ties in with what we talked about earlier about how uh, Buzz Lightyear was you know part of the Galactic Alliance. And that new ager named Elizabeth April, who astral traveled and met members of the Galactic Alliance who want to uh, liberate our prison planet and so forth. And so here's an article from August of 2019 titled, Epstein Murdered to Hide Satanic Pedophile Network Manipulating Global Elites. And then here's another one, U.S. Special Forces Arrest Satanic Pedophile Group. So here are some very blatant references to satanic pedophilia coming directly from the New Age. This is also the case with Vladimir Putin, who's another major confirmation of the things that I've been talking about on my channel. Uh, he's been speaking out against Satanism and pedophilia for many years now. Okay, I'm going to play a clip here. This is a clip from a speech that Putin gave almost 10 years ago, back in 2013 where he explicitly calls out Satanism and pedophilia as being the greatest threats to Western culture. We see how many Euro-Atlantic countries have actually gone on the path of their roots, in particular, and from Christian values, which are the basis of the Western civilization. Отрицаются нравственные начала и любая традиционная идентичность, национальная, культурная, религиозная или даже половая. Проводится политика, ставящая на один уровень многодетную семью и однополое партнерство, веру в Бога или веру в сатану. Эксцессы политкорректности доходят до того, что всерьез говорится о регистрации партий, ставящих своей целью пропаганду педофилии. Люди во многих европейских странах стыдятся и боятся говорить о своей религиозной принадлежности. Праздники отменяют уже. И, или называют их как-то по-другому, стыдливо прячут саму суть этого праздника, нравственную основу этих праздников. И эту модель пытаются агрессивно навязывать всем, всему миру. Убежден, это прямой путь к деградации и примеветизации, к глубокому демографическому и нравственному кризису. Что еще может быть большим свидетельством морального кризиса человеческого социума, как не утрата способности к самовоспроизводству? So he was addressing this moral crisis of the West, right? Moral crisis. And how the West's Christian roots are being uprooted by the invasion of homosexuality, gender fluidity, political correctness, pedophilia, and Satanism. Doesn't that basically sum up what the conservative Christian right is talking about today? Everyone is saying how there's a moral crisis plaguing the nation because of the suppression of Christian values, the abandonment of our nation's so-called Christian roots, right, and the invasion of political correctness, gender fluidity, and the increasing normalization of pedophilia and Satanism. Putin explicitly mentioned all those things in this speech. And this is what we're hearing more and more of today, is this lamenting of the downfall of Western values and Western culture. And that's exactly what Putin has been lamenting for a long time now. This is what the Great Awakening is. It's a Gentile revolt to preserve its culture 
and its values against the Zionist Jew New World Order invasion. That's what Putin's war in the Ukraine is about, going to war against the New World Order. He's a false light type who wants to fight against Satanism, pedophilia, globalism, and the New World Order. Um, Even Jordan Peterson has acknowledged that Putin's anti-woke ideology is one of the main factors behind his war in the Ukraine. Listen to this. I usually touch on religious issues and then cultural issues pertaining mostly now to the culture war that we seem to be engulfed in, I would say, not only in the West, but in the rest of the world, and which has actually broken out into a real war. I think Putin has weaponized a certain degree of anti-woke sentiment among Russians. And some of that anti-woke doctrine, let's say, which is more conservative, he may also believe. But minimally, he's managed to use it very effectively on the propaganda front. And uh, that's certainly one of the factors that's driving the war and sustaining it and causing it. Okay, so in 2013, Putin publicly addressed a moral crisis in the West because of the abandonment of Christian values and the advancement of gender fluidity, pedophilia, and Satanism. And then less than 10 years later, he attacks the Ukraine under the pretense of fighting the New World Order. So hopefully we're starting to get a better idea, if we haven't already, about where this growing concern about the spread of Satanism and pedophilia in America is ultimately heading. Okay, it's heading in a militant direction. That's one of the watchwords for postmillennialism and nationalism. Okay, and both NAR and Reform leaders are using this term militant in reference to the church. Okay, Lance Wall now said that in the trailer for the series, right? How the church is going to get to a militant level of maturity. The stuff at Disney is not just leading to the normalization of pedophilia. It's leading to something beyond that. And I think Putin is a good picture of where things are ultimately heading as this global freedom movement, this great awakening against communism and Satanism continues to spread. And we move closer and closer to the beginning of the tribulation with the breaking of the first seal, with a white horse that mimics Christ, which I think is representative of the great awakening uh, the, this post-millennial, quote-unquote, Christian crusade to conquer evil, and then the eventual rise of the beast and his war against the harlot and the saints. And speaking of the harlot, here's a very interesting article from the Jerusalem Post from 2013. This is the same year that Putin gave the speech uh, calling out pedophilia and Satanism. And it's titled, uh, Putin, First Soviet Government Was Mostly Jewish. Okay, so this is Putin acknowledging the Jewish identity of the first Soviet government, which he opposes. Okay, and this would make sense, again, because, you know, communism was ultimately a Jewish creation, with Karl Marx being Jewish. That's why Hitler hated communism so much, because uh, he saw it as part of the international Jewish conspiracy to control the world, and he believed that they would eventually create a state to help push this agenda forward, i.e. Israel. And then underneath here it says, a Russian president says predominantly Jewish Soviet government was guided by false ideological considerations. And what was really interesting was how Putin said that this Jewish-run Soviet government suppressed the religious freedom of the people, right? Because that's another major part of this false light movement, is how this tyrannical agenda is you know, suppressing our religious freedoms, and we need to fight to preserve them. So while this may not be outright hatred of Jews coming from Putin, it is a recognition on his part of the negative impacts that Jewish communists have had on his country and how they held false ideological considerations and suppressed people's freedoms. And I think that's significant. And so I have no doubt that there are some elite Jews who are part of some kind of incredibly wicked system that's trying to subdue the rest of the world to control them. That's why Jerusalem is called Babylon in Revelation, because it's become so incredibly wicked that God has to use the beast system of all things to cleanse it before Christ can come and set up the millennial kingdom. Okay, and a quick point about that is, I know people bring up the point about how, well, it says that Babylon will uh, fall never to rise again, so how can Jerusalem be the harlot? Um, well, I, I think the, the simple response to that is, 
it says that Babylon will never rise again. In other words, apostate Jerusalem will never rise again. And anyway, so in order to subdue the world, the European West, which is the pinnacle of Gentile civilization, has to decline. And so I think all these things that the false light is exposing and rebelling against are coming from an elite Zionist agenda to subdue the world. And European civilization is the greatest hurdle for a Jewish takeover. I believe that's why things like critical race theory and cultural Marxism have been implemented and have been so effective at making white people feel guilty and bad for being white. I think that's how you tear down the West, is make it feel bad about its history and its heritage, and you introduce things like gender fluidity that completely destroy the family structure and destroy Western values and traditions and freedoms, all these things that make it very powerful, You know, which Putin has been warning are under attack by some kind of satanic pedophile agenda. As Q said in that drop that I read before, um, the Rothschilds, again, a Jewish family, are the cult leaders of the New World Order and worship Satan, right? And that's the very thing that Putin has been publicly speaking against and is now uh, going to war against. Maybe not very effectively, but the point is still to be taken. And just to further drive home my point about Putin's alignment with the false light Gnostic awakening movement, many of you guys are probably familiar with the news organization Russia Today, uh, popularly known as RT News which is incredibly conspiracy truther oriented. Um, it's aired stories exposing Bohemian Grove and the Rothschilds, once again, the harlot, the satanic cult. It's had Alex Jones and Stephen Greer on the programs. Jesse Ventura, who's you know big into conspiracy theory, um, he has a show, his own show on RT News. And the slogan for RT News is Question More, which is very similar to the Question Everything slogan from the QAnon movement. And RT News is funded by the Russian state, so Putin is very supportive of it. So there's this growing acknowledgement across the world of Satanism and this growing exposure of Satanism within the false light movement. Uh, there is a worldwide Jehu movement exposing the global Jezebelic cult of Baal. Whether it's QAnon or the New Age or the Truthers or the NAR, or Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin, or a bunch of other Christian channels who are just trying to get clicks and don't really know what they're doing. The false light in all its various forms, from all its various angles, is speaking out against this blatant Satanism, which ultimately points back to some kind of Babylonian cultic system that a group of elite Zionist Jews have set up. That's what the harlot is, and it's why the beast will destroy the harlot. That's why God will use the beast to destroy the harlot. And this is why I'm weary about Christians getting too caught up in this exposure of Satanism. Whether it's the satanic pedophilia and child grooming stuff in Disney and Hollywood, or the satanic rituals that often take place at you know the Super Bowl halftime shows and rock concerts, or the Satanism and rock and roll, Marvel in DC, whatever. And the issue I have is that Christian channels who focus so much on this stuff are not doing their followers and subscribers any good because they don't realize the full dangers of trutherism and don't realize that many of their followers and subscribers are still stuck in trutherism and the rabbit hole and Gnostic type thinking. Okay, Gnosticism is not Satanism. Gnosticism, true Gnosticism, is going to war against Satanism, exposing Satanism. And talking so much about the satanic rituals at Super Bowl halftime shows keeps people stuck in the Gnostic rabbit hole. These overtly satanic rituals and symbols and activities, these are things that the New Age and Truther movements have been talking about for decades. And then in recent years, we've had this growth of the QAnon and Patriot movements talking about taking down the satanic pedophiles. And now, through the intensification of the LGBT movement, the fight against the satanic pedophiles is spreading even further to where it's now become one of the main fights of the entire conservative Christian camp. Right, like I showed earlier with Ali Beth Stuckey and Matt Walsh, uh, both talking about the spread of this child grooming phenomenon. John MacArthur is also warning about the normalization of pedophilia. So many others as well. 
So this fight to protect the children against the creepy satanic leftists is another way that the truther and QAnon movements have become mainstream. At this point, there's really not much difference between Ben Shapiro and Alex Jones. There really isn't. The substance is essentially the same. And the church more and more is getting sucked into this false light culture war against Satanism, which is the same enemy that Gnosticism is fighting against. Gnosticism is fighting against the satanic control system, which ties in perfectly with the whole uh, Jehu versus Jezebel typology because you know, Satanism is essentially the modern-day equivalent of ancient Baalism. And we're seeing how the devil is using a very moral cause, probably the most moral of all, the protection of children, as a way of pushing spiritual deception. It started with the QAnon movement, and it's now spread to the entire conservative Christian movement. Even though the mainstream Christian right might not be as overtly extreme as the QAnon movement in some of its claims, you know, with shape-shifting reptilians and good and bad aliens and all that, they fundamentally share the same goal, which is the dominance of some kind of Christian-based love and light culture and Enlightenment-era philosophy and freedom and all that stuff, anti-communism, anti-wokeness, etc., and they're all fighting the same enemy, right? That's the key. They all have their sights set on the same enemy. The sick, perverted, New World Order elites that want global communism and the Great Reset. And that's the danger, guys. We see this in Scripture. Okay, I pointed this out before. The Pharisees and Sadducees, enemies, right? Did not like each other. But they united because they had the same enemy. Christ, the apostles, etc., so there's clear biblical precedent, and even just precedent in you know the human condition. We see this over and over again. People are willing to compromise when they have the same enemy, the same ultimate enemy. And so this war on children, as MacArthur calls it, is one of the most powerful snares that's pulling Christians, and particularly Christian parents, into the culture war trap and fighting for your rights and trying to save America and making spiritual compromises in order to reach that goal. That's where a lot of people are drawing the line and finally getting into the fight, so to speak, is when it comes to the children. That's the issue that's finally waking people up to join the culture war and stand up for the Constitution and fight for Christian cultural domination under the pretense that it's a spiritual war. And you can say, well, no, I'm not a dominionist. I'm not fighting for uh, Christian dominionism. Well, are you fighting for the Constitution that supposedly is rooted in Christian-based values, well, you're still getting caught up in that. In some way or another, just because you reject the Seven Mountain Mandate doesn't mean that you're still not kind of heading in that direction. If you're fighting to preserve the Constitution, if that's your main thing, if that's your main idol, then you are heading down the Dominionist path, especially if you've bought into the false pretense that it's all a spiritual war. And as we've seen, the targeting of children is the breaking point for even people like Bill Maher to finally say, okay, this woke culture is insane, and i got to distance myself from it. It's even become one of the main points of common ground for people like Ben Shapiro and Bill Maher, two people who otherwise are on completely opposite sides of the aisle. And really just a few years ago were kind of you know at loggerheads with each other. But now they're sitting down and talking very cordially. Same with feminist Kara Dansky and Charlie Kirk. Right? Charlie Kirk said how these interesting times create fun alliances, he said, and how they can both agree on the dangers of the LGBT movement despite their extreme political and religious differences. Anyway, guys, we'll go ahead and stop there. Uh, what was originally part two has grown immensely, and so I've decided to split it up into two parts, and we'll pick up right where we left off here in the next part. God bless.